Cheers, queers. What's on the big gay agenda today, Theora? Today, we are continuing our scene-by-scene -scene breakdown of Blank the Series, and today we'll be covering episode 204, probably parts one and two. Yes, <laughs> that is the plan. That is the plan. All right, before yeah, we get so into that, just... If you're new, hello and welcome. This is a discussion episode where we'll be breaking down all every scene and diving into all the deliciousness that is Blank the Series. If you're not into that and you don't like our opinions, don't listen to this. You are under no obligation to do so. But if you are, thank you for joining. We really appreciate your support and appreciate how much you appreciate Blank the Series. If you want more Blank content, just become a Patreon member for $5 a month. We react to everything. You get these episodes early without ads. There's just a bunch of stuff over there. Check it out. Have fun. Become a free member and you can see what we're up to because we usually post content there early so you can see what's going on. If you're not about that life, that's fine. Join our Discord. There's a bunch of people in there who are into Blank, who are into all the Thai girl love shows that are happening. So just have, meet some friends and talk about all these shows. That's really the whole point of why we're doing this. So check it out. Before we begin this episode, let's do our daily hydration for Phi. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. The double hydrate. It's her birthday. <laughs> oh, yeah. In two days. I mean, by the time you get this, it, <laughs> it will be her birthday. <laughs> yeah. Her birthday celebration is going on right now. Yes, it is. Okay, so let's get into this episode where, unfortunately, we pick up right where we left off. So we, it, this episode starts with the end of episode three, where Big Nung is dropping off Little Nung with Chad. And they have to deal with this whole proposal thing now. Again. So, <laughs> yeah. Big Nung is like, Chad, what, what are you doing? And he doesn't and why? answer. He just slowly pulls the ring away and stands up telling her that she doesn't have to give him an answer right now. And he can wait. But, like, I feel like that was an answer in itself. <laughs> you would think. You if would think. reacts like that. There is no way they're going to say yes. But we already established he doesn't think. <sighs> He, but he's also not good at taking no for an answer. Probably because he doesn't listen to it. The fact that he has the audacity to look confused. Like, she dumped you once. <laughs> like, why are you doing this? She uh, didn't like, just dump him. She ran away from him on their wedding day. <laughs> <laughs> like, remember chasing after her, Chet? We all saw it. Like... And she was, like, cackling in that taxi that was going God knows where. Like, remember that, Chet? Where did she go? That's a No one question. ever. We never found out. Anyway. Uh, the only person... Who, I mean, not the only. The person who has the right to be confused in this scene is Big Nung. Okay? Because in her brain, this came out of nowhere. Okay? But honestly, like, if you really watch the show, Chet has been high-key courting her in public, like, f the whole show, and she's just been ignoring him. I mean, fair, right? And then, like, in the last episode, she explicitly told him, do not cross lines with me. And here he is, crossing the biggest line you could possibly be crossing. Like, to your point, and what we've said many times, Chet doesn't actually listen to people when they talk to him. Like, he doesn't listen. He's one of those people that comes into conversations with his mind already made up, and he's looking for you to confirm the decision he already made, but he's not listening to you, and he will not take your input into changing his own mind. He's just stuck in his mindset, and he's like, yes, just confirm what I already thought. And then when people don't confirm what he already thought, he's like, he's the math meme, where he's like, I don't understand. <laughs> Like, dude, it's not hard. You just refuse to listen to literally anybody. He doesn't listen. No, he doesn't. And Big Gong knows this because, you know, at in this point, he's also been in her life for half her life. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, unfortunately. unfortunately. And now she's like, oh, I can definitely answer you right now. I don't love you. I never have. I love that big big nung the woman who like evades questions and is silent i love how straightforward she is like immediately she's like no let's just the answer is no absolutely not never 
not in a million years yet. Like, I love that she just immediately is like, absolutely not. Let's just end this. We don't need to. No. You can't even be polite with this dude. Because that's what we've been doing this entire show. And it just, nothing's working. I mean, this whole doesn't work either. But anyway, we'll get there. (laughs) None of it works. All the tactics don't work. Yeah. And during this whole exchange, Chet looks hopeful about everything. And I don't understand how all this could go down. And he still looks hopeful. It's just that he's not listening. He's like, she's still standing here and hasn't said no. But like, what if she did say yes? What would their life be like if they got married? It wouldn't be happy. I I mean, I don't even want to think about that. Because <laughs> what about Big Nung and Little Nung? That's fucked up. <laughs> I used to sleep with my stepmother. Like, what the hell was that? (laughs) No, I don't want to go there at all or imagine that. Fair. I mean, I didn't think about that. So, yeah, Caitlin, there's a lot of reasons this is not going to work. That's the main reason it's not going to work. Like Big Nung says, she doesn't love him. She's in love with his daughter (laughs) standing right next to her. Also confused. Yeah, um, but when Big Nung says, I have never loved you, he finally seems to get that it's not going to go his way, at least. At least for today. <laughs> right. And Big Nung goes on to say that if she did love him, he wouldn't have had to ask her to marry him for a second time, which... <laughs> Would that not be the biggest red flag of all time? Seriously, Aside like her being like, don't, is this a fake date, Chet? Don't cross lines with me. I don't, he just doesn't listen. He doesn't listen. He doesn't look either, because she was literally running away from him. He's a fucking idiot. I can't watch how stupid Chet is. <laughs> okay, this whole scene, I, I hate it, but I also kind of love it. It's a mess. <laughs> just like the show. I love it. Um, I love the show. <laughs> Nothing. Okay, I'm sorry. We're how many other shows in, and like this is still the best one. <laughs> we're, Gosh, no, we're watching like five right now. Anyway, yeah, this is still the best one. It okay, has so everything. While Big Nung is saying all this, Little Nung gets this coy smile that says, "You tell him, babe." But obviously, Chet can't know that she is happy about this, so she plays it off while looking away into the sky because i love her face if you just watch her she's like (laughs) um Mm -hmm. yeah i just she's really good she's really great at these like little reactions i love her faces yeah good job yoko yeah i love this one in particular because okay so what's happening in the scene basically big nong is saying I can't marry you because I don't love you. So, like, Little Nung's like, well, she loves me, which means marriage is definitely on the table. So, basically, Big Nung just admitted one of her, like, stipulations for marriage is I have to be in love with you. And then she's like, perfect. You're in love with me. You can see it from space. So, that means marriage is on the table for real. Remember I floated that out in your apartment in season one after I found out you could cook? And I was like, we're getting married after I graduate. Now, she's like, that's actually a possibility now. So I think that's why she's really smiling. She's like, oh, shit. Yeah. It's gonna be me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Little Nun didn't have to worry, though, about Chet seeing her being happy because he wouldn't have noticed it. So continuing with Chet. Chet has the audacity. Again, so much. He, he has so much audacity in general. This but is where Little Nun gets one. it from. Yeah, this is where Little Nun gets it from. This whole scene is audacity at its fine and stupidity. Little Nun doesn't yeah. get his stupidity. Thank God she did not inherit that. Oh she got my all the gosh, brains. where those brains came from? I don't know. <laughs> Both her parents have stupidity. Okay, I know. Did it's they cancel weird- each other out? Those genes? <laughs> <laughs> like, where did she get her smarts from? I don't. She I got truly the obsessive gene for smarts. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. Okay. So, but Chet says that he thought it would be good for them because he still loves her. Oh my god. Translation, it would be good for him because he still wants to use her. Like, no world, no part of this would be good for Big Nung. 
Like, literally. Like, okay. So, what I can't stand is that apparently, like, no is not good enough answer for Chet. So, like, he keeps going because for some reason, I think he's honestly confused by her response, like, Big Nong's response to all of this. Because his rationale is not necessarily, like, it's about you and me, Big Nong. He says, well, if we get married, then we're one big happy family. You clearly love my daughter. And he's like, and I love you. So, like, is that not enough love to be the perfect family? And it's like, but then she doesn't <laughs> love you. That's the missing connection. Like, yeah, no, um, buddy, you're you're somehow going to become the father-in-law. Like, that's it's, it's it's a whole really weird dynamic that we have to have a board for. But anyway, when. He we're says, not there yet. He can't seem to understand why Big Nung doesn't no. like him. And we're not we're not there yet. That's going to break his brain later. <laughs> that brain is just... It, uh, doesn't there, it's a mystery. That's the question. Mm. Is. But when he says that Little Nung loves Big Nung too, Little Nung's face looks like she wants to scream, Bitch, you don't know me. <laughs> <laughs> I love... She's he a does great, it! I mean... I mean, she does love her, but he doesn't actually know that because he never actually talked to her about Big Nung before. Because I don't think he actually had a conversation with her. No, I don't think he ever has. Okay, so then Chet goes into the whole, we can be a family thing. And yes, they are going to be a family, but he has to, There, it's a long journey to that. And Little Nung speaks up, though, and tells him that she never said she wanted Big Nung to be her mother. <laughs> Correct. The last thing no she one wants. has ever said that. <laughs> and Big Nung has never said, I want her to be my daughter, either. No one has ever said that. No. They're she's very looked, careful with their words. She's looked very uncomfortable every time, like, this type of thing is brought up. Because it's uncomfortable. And Little Nung's voice sounds so tired here. Because usually she has so much energy and, like, she, everything out of her mouth is excited. But, I mean, she didn't get enough sleep last night. <laughs> Let's be real. <laughs> but she's also exhausted having to constantly tell Chet that he is wrong and needs to actually listen and talk to her. Which Literally. is exhausting for us to have to keep telling It's him exhausting <laughs> for everyone, except Chet apparently is fine being trapped in this circle of hell that we're in with these conversations. It's like he wakes up and he's like, I know what I'm going to do. He's stuck in Groundhog Day. Like, you're right. Does he have amnesia when, it, when he has conversations with people and he just doesn't commit it to memory and he's like... Get Little Nung a car. Got it. Even though he just had this huge conversation with Big Mom where she's like, don't get her the car. She doesn't want the fucking car. And then he's like, oh yeah, I gotta get him buy a car today. Yeah, like, <laughs> like, it never happened. It's like, dude, what? That's <sighs> Chet. That's Chet. Yeah. So Little Nung also goes on to tell him that she never wanted him to treat her like a daughter, too. Which Chet has no response for. Yep. Like, let us not forget how messy this whole situation actually is, though, guys, because no one wants to be here except Chet. <laughs> and he knows the least about what's going on. So, <laughs> but uh, after she says this, Little Nung, okay, so <clears throat> she basically says Chet, like, she speaks her mind very directly and bluntly. And I think Little Nung is emboldened to do so because Big Nung is being very blunt to Chet. And it's not like, in a way, you know, when you have to talk to some men to be like, well, I'm trying to soften the blow. And you do that and it doesn't work because they don't understand what you're saying. And they're like, there's still hope. And Little Big Nung's like, no, there is no hope. You need to understand there's no hope. It's not happening. I left you once. I'm leaving you now. It's not, There's nothing to leave. There is no us. Like, get out of here. So while Big Nung is doing this, Little Nung speaks her mind about... Her, about Chet where she's like I don't I never asked you to be my dad I don't want you to be my dad and when she says this she looks at Big Nung okay like she's expecting Big Nung to protest this because in the past Big Nung explicitly told Little Nung to not say those things about Chet and here she is saying it directly not just out loud but to Chet 
So Little Wong's like, oh shit, was that okay for me to say that? Because I thought we were just being honest right now. And like, if you look at Big Nung, she looks at Little Nong and it's not like disappointed or anything. I think she's just also tired and pissed off that Chet never listens to anyone. So I think she's like, I'll let it slide, Little Nong. It's just like, he doesn't get it, whatever. Like, I guess Speak your mind. He'll forget Speak about it tomorrow morning. <laughs> exactly. He's not listening anyway. So you might as well say whatever you're going to say. He's not going to listen. Yeah, so Little Nung then asks if Big Nung can just take her home. And Big Nung looks to Chet, and I think part of her wants him to say anything to Little Nung right now. Just, like, say something. This, this girl just told you how she is feeling. And, I mean, barely. It was, like, one thing. But just say something yeah. to her that you understand or, like, you will try something else. Ask her how she is feeling. But he's a coward and he stays silent. So Big Nung, Big Nung, Big Nung, just Big Nung, Nung. (laughs) just unfortunately has to be like, fine, I'll get her out of here. So she nods her head and tells him to excuse them. And Chet tries to get Big Nung to stay because he says, hold on, but he directs it towards her and not Little Nung. And it's interesting that he only says something when Big Nung is about to leave and doesn't address his daughter at all. Like, this whole thing just reiterates that he doesn't really care about his daughter. It's all about appearances. I mean, Big Nung is all about appearances for him as well, because I'm sure he doesn't actually love her. No, he's really comfortable with using Little Nung. Because remember, why are we here? Little Nung is the excuse to marry Big Nung, because he's like, I love you. And Big Nung's like, well, I don't love you. And he's like, okay... But she loves you, and I know you love her. So, like, do it for her, because you guys have a have a bond. Like, and then I can get both of you. And then, so, again, he doesn't care about Little Nong. He's fine with using her as a prop to get what he wants. So, like, the whole thing he's after is not so Little Nong can have a mother figure. It's so that he can get Big Nong, and he's just okay. using her as an excuse. Even, all right, pretend like the relationship doesn't exist. Even if they wanted a mother-daughter relationship okay they didn't need chet that's what i mean like he's not he is not in this equation no matter what yeah even if the nungs weren't romantically involved with each other like this also like marrying you to officially be somebody's stepmother also not a reason to get married like it's like this still would end up the same way like big nung would still be like no what the hell do i need to marry you for we're doing just fine yeah life was great before you came in <laughs> Right, but like to your point, it's like this is this scene is just more evidence that like Chet really doesn't care about either of them. He just cares about himself and he's just trying to use everybody to get what he wants. Yeah. And he's trying to stop them to basically keep them there. And Big Nung says that they'll just talk later because it seems like they won't be able to talk it out today. Because I mean any day, but definitely not. Talking today. talking it out requires that one part both parties are listening, but so that was never going to happen. So when the nuns walk away, they leave a very confused chat behind because he doesn't understand what just happened because he's not listening to anybody. He's like, well, I laid out the perfect argument. I don't understand why this didn't work out. Meanwhile, he didn't listen to Big Nung being like, I don't love you. And that's my number one requirement for marriage. And then Little Nung, who's like, I don't want you in my life, period. And he didn't hear any of that. He just was like, I said all the right, right things. Why didn't I get the, Why didn't I get the princess? I don't understand. The other thing they leave behind, though, which is important to note, is Little Nong's luggage. (laughs) Yes, that will be important. Uh, Also note, there's very dramatic music playing while all this is going. So dramatic. It's the most dramatic music in the show. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. So Which, not necessary, because, like, this scene was anticlimactic because, like, we knew she wasn't going to say yes. <laughs> it should have been like, I don't know what exhausting music is, but. <laughs> <That's> exhausting <laughs> music. It's like the instruments yeah, right? are dying at the end. Right. Yeah, like some <laughs> kind of like horn that just won't stop. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Then we cut to the nuns in the car leaving whatever the hell that was in their dust. <laughs> just like the wedding, Chet. Remember that? No, you don't. Literally. And the music immediately changes to their happy lover music while Little Nung is busy staring at Big Nung while Big Nung is driving. And Little Nung has the biggest smile on her face. And I think I just 
it's hilarious the music because it's so quick to change to the happy music too it's just a very funny contrast and it just shows that they're happy together they don't need anybody else literally they don't really i mean they do but they don't (laughs) yeah and little nung's like you're so cool and big nung starts looking around not knowing how to take this compliment and asks about what and little Nung loved how she rejected her dad so firmly. I mean, she's been doing that since day one. I know. Um, but she's also been trying to do it gently for a very long time. But obviously that wasn't working. So it has to come to this. And I mean, was like running out on the first wedding gentle? <laughs> like, no, she has no, been no. rejecting I mean, this like, man in all manners. Once Little Nung came into the situation, she I know. did it gently because for bi- <laughs> Little Nung's sake. Um, but uh, it's nothing. Yeah. I mean, nothing's working with this man. Just shake him. Literally like, He's almost unconscious. But I mean, if Little Nung thinks that Big Nung's rejection is hot, so be it. Yeah, no, I love when she's, like, rejecting my father in front of me is hot, ma'am. Which, yes, I agree. To hydrate for all of that. That was lovely. And basically, Big Nung's response is, well, your father's a bigger dumbass than my sister. So, like, this is going to take a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, that, that got me off guard. Um, and then Big Nung says, again... Well, we're all thinking she doesn't love him, so how could she marry him? And Little Nung smirks and says, that's right. The one you love is sitting right here. They are both smiling and flirting throughout the scene, and it's just so cute. I love seeing them be together because their relationship, we've said before, is like very secure in the fact that they we know that they love each other. It's all these stupid external factors that are trying to keep them apart. I mean, that's that's the drama. That's the drama. Yeah, so, like, basically what Little Nung is doing, I like this conversation because what Little Nung is doing, because, again, she got the intel from the prior scene where Big Nung is like, I can't marry you. I don't love you. And Little Nung's like, perfect. File that away. So what she's doing is she's dangling the bait of, like, Big Nung's admittance in the prior scene where you said, you know, you, you won't marry somebody unless you're in love with them and you're in love with me. So she's like, what are you going to do about that big nug? She's like dangling that bait. And then points out like, yeah, yeah, you love me. And then so little nung, the big nung whisperer, is putting out, again, this is one of those things, I've brought this up before. They never actually talk directly about their own relationship. Like for all the communicating they do, they never actually talk about what is this? What are we? Where are we headed? They never have that direct conversation, but they have conversations like this where they're basically talking about it in more of an organic way where it just like comes up and they just kind of talk about it, but never like have a direct line by line conversation, which like that's real life. So I do love this because Little Nung is like testing the waters to be like, can we get married one day without directly asking Big Nung that? Because you can't directly ask Big Nung big scary questions because she'll get scared and like go into her shell like a turtle, right? Because like at this point, Little Nung is confident that the answer is yes, Big Nung is thinking about marrying her one day. But like she wants to see Big Nung's reaction for herself because validation and that's fun. I'm picturing I'm picturing them as um a Thai version of <laughs> Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles now. Don't know why I continue <laughs> the turtle thing. I was just thinking, like, I could see her as a turtle. <laughs> All right, no more animal metaphors for me. Okay. So what's Big Nung's response? So she makes eye contact with Little Nung and smiles holds it for a second and then looks off into the distance very briefly and she's got this like dreamy look on her face like she's picturing the future scenario that little nung is throwing out there and she's happy about it so perhaps big nung hasn't quite thought this all the way through but like here's little nung basically implying marry me and here's big 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 nung's response is to process it and like think about it and she seems happy about it for like a minute But then that's big and scary. And like they have a million hurdles to get over before they can even get to that point. Like getting rid of her dad (laughs) and all this nonsense. So then 
that's scary. So big, what does big nun do? She gay panics in the most ridiculous way. So what does she do, Caitlin? She tries to play it off and says, who said I love you? Oh my God, you <laughs> idiot. What the hell was last night, big nun? I swear to God. And like, okay, so she's she denies that she loves little nun, basically. And then is visibly squirming this whole conversation in the car. And little nun's looking at her and just like laughing for a minute but then like she goes from like being smug and confident about the whole marriage thing to like super pissed off because she's like what the fuck kind of answer is this bitch like (laughs) i mean very fair and i think a part of little nung starts to panic a tiny bit because even though she knows that big nung does in fact love her like (laughs) what was that but big nung finishes her teasing by saying it's you who loved me yeah, that's what pissed off Little Nog. She's like, are you fucking serious? <laughs> but it's basically throwing what Little Nog does to her back at her. And this is when Little Nog realizes she's just teasing, teasing her back. And she tells Big Nung that she loves her so much that it can be seen from Mars. And that she's just in denial. Yeah, I love that she says you're in denial because Little Nung is directly addressing Big Nung's behavioral patterns and calling her out. This whole These whole two scenes are about being as direct as possible with people because like, yeah, Big Nung does the thing where she evades stuff and then act plays dumb and Little Nung's like, no, you're just pretending you're in denial about this, but you're not. Like, let's be real. And Big Nung, when she says this, Big Nung says nothing, which means yes, she's trying to cling to her denial. And meanwhile, she's still squirming in the car seat while she's driving. <laughs> so Little Nung is like, okay, let's, uh, why don't I tease the denial straight out of you? So she leans across the console of the car while Big Nung's dry- driving and then turns on her bedroom voice. <laughs> yes. Little Nung continues her teasing by asking her if she's only good at saying I love you when they are in that moment. At this, at this point, Big Nung is probably thinking, girl, you need to stop or else I'm going to have to pull this car over and we're going to have a moment right now. And I think Little Nung would totally be fine with that. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think what Little Nung is trying to point out really in this conversation is that Again, it's big. It, she's pointing out Big Nung's behavioral patterns, which is when they are all alone, safe behind closed doors, that's when Big Nung lets her guard down. And when she does, Big Nung is a lot braver in feeling her emotions, first of all, and then openly expressing them. Okay, so in, in those moments, in that moment, that's when Big Nung is able to voice her true feelings out loud. That's when, like, she's completely unguarded. So if you go back to the end of the last episode where she's freaking out that big, Little Nung disappeared, she finds Little Nung. She said all the things that were in her heart without even a, a second's guess. Like, she said all the things immediately. But also, where were they? They were in Big Nung's house, alone by themselves. Like, no one can interrupt them. Like... She had Little Nung there, so she felt safer. Like, that's when she can be super vulnerable, okay? And so that's usually the situation when they are about to be physically intimate as well. So bottom line is, like, that's when Big Nung's most unguarded, tapping into her feelings, and that's when she's able to tell Little Nung how she really feels. Like, not whatever this... Like, in this scene, they're coming off the cusp of Chet doing whatever. So, like... Big Nong doesn't feel super safe, and so she's more guarded because she had to be guarded around Chet. Even though she was being direct with him, there's still a level of, like, emotional barrier that she still has up from that situation. So, Little Nong, of course, is teasing Big Nong now about her pattern of behavior. And secretly, I think Little Nong enjoys this because... This pattern where, like, when they're alone, that's when Big Nung is most Big Nung. Because I think Little Nung secretly likes that Big Nung is only 100% vulnerable with her. And she's the only person that gets to see that. That That's special, right? To be the only person that, like, sees that side of another human being. So same reason why she can't resist that cute voice that Big Nung does. Because Big Nung only does it with her. So it's one of those other things. So, like, while she's, like... She's like, I know you're like this, but you're only like it with me. So I'm the only person who can call you out kind of thing. But like, she can tease her about it because she's like, I know you mean it, but like, this is what you keep doing. 
And so, of course, and then Big Dong's old school. So she's like, can you only do it when it's sexy times? And Big Dong's like, what? No, like, what? No, like, don't say. <laughs> this is the woman who thinks eating food in public is porn. And here's Little Nong basically talking about, you only say you love me when we're both naked. And Little Big Dong's like, what? No, I've never been naked in my life. What are you talking about? Like, that's, <laughs> that's the what, denial. <laughs> yeah, that's what she's in denial about. Yeah, literally. So, <laughs> Big Nung changes the subject by asking her, don't you take this topic seriously? I just got proposed to. But, like, can As if that was a serious proposal. Serious? Like, <laughs> right, like, yeah, what? who's taking that seriously? No, this is Big Nung deflecting because she's embarrassed by Little Nung being like, you do know we have sex with each other, right? You do know that. <laughs> Big Nung's like, no, we don't. What are you talking about? <laughs> See, like, they ended the last episode with this proposal Expecting us to think that that was a cliffhanger, but it wasn't a That's cliffhanger. What I'm saying. I think no. <laughs> it would be more of a cliffhanger if he was just playing with something in his pocket. We didn't see the ring and we were like, oh my God, what is he going to do? Is, is it a it- gun? Is it- <laughs> yeah, like seriously. No, a desk drawer. That's what should have happened. He just goes into the desk drawer. No, not even that. If he had some cryptic line where he's like, He's where he's where it like some some double meaning where he basically says something where it implies like he knows about them. That would have been a bigger cliffhanger, and then it was really him geared up for the proposal. Yes, that would have been like that would have been a better cliffhanger. But the proposal is like, not. A he's like, we can't keep ignoring this. It's time for us to confront this head on, like that. And then like it cuts, and then it opens in the next episode. And he's like, we should get married. And it's like, ew, what? That was he could have <laughs> even said something you know like, I mean? we need to talk about your guys' relationship, right? <laughs> right, something like and that. Then have exactly. them look at each other, and then it could be like, so I know you guys have an incredible bond, and I still love you, Big Nung. Will you marry me? Right, that exactly. That would have been perfect. That would have been better. Yeah, but obviously. I mean, the biggest shock right. would be no if one she took said this yes, seriously, and like, that would, would be the third season of them. Had, it's in, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> I don't even want to think about it. Kayla, you froze, and your face is in the most weird position. <laughs> <laughs> it was like <laughs> it just froze. I was like, "You're right there, Kayla." Am I back? Okay. You're back. You loaded. You're back. You're back. <laughs> I love it when it does that. Okay. So, of course Little Nung doesn't take this seriously because she knows that Big Nung is hers already. And how could she let her marry someone else? It was never, ever, ever gonna happen. No. No, no one takes chat seriously. You know that's Big Nung. (laughs) And then Big Nung's like, don't you feel shy or embarrassed when you say such things? No, I think that's you, Big Nung. <laughs> Literally, she is projecting. Projection, Your Honor. Yes, she is the epitome of project- projection. Yes, yes, she actually, she, she definitely is. So I think the reason she is saying these things is that I think Big Nung is a little bit nervous that the proposal happened in front of Little Nung because... Like, it, she's the person Big Dong is dating and wants to marry someday, deep down whether she's still in denial about that or not. And I think she's worried on some level that, like, Little Dong is going to be mad slash jealous. Because, like, Little Dong gets mad and jealous, you know, see Juan Viva. But Juan yeah. Viva is more of a threat than Chet. So, like, it's justified. From the very beginning, Little Nung was not afraid of Chet. Like, no. he was. He's just this, like, mosquito that keeps coming around. Correct. He's annoying. He's not actually threatening. Juan Viva's actually threatening. But, like, Little Nung knows this proposal is bullshit because Big Nung is hers already and because Big Nung just admitted a few seconds ago that she will only marry someone she loves. So, like, Little Nung's like, what the- I am even more secure in our relationship now that this <laughs> happened than I was a minute ago. What do you mean, Big Nung? You're the one who's spiraling because I'm on to you. She's like, I'm so turned on right now. No, I was right. not taking any of this <laughs> seriously. Literally. Like, she's like, I took it seriously when you said I need to be in love with you, somebody, before I marry them. Yeah. So, like, I again, a refreshing part of the scene is that Little Nung is more secure in their relationship. So it's always nice when that happens because usually it's her getting insecure. 
And usually it's like suitors taking Big Nung away from her. And so here she's like, mm, they're not, this man is not a threat. And I think that like Big Nung very, showed her very plainly in this scene and in the prior scene with Chet that like Big Nung is hers 100%. And like, Little Nung needs that validation. Yes. And Little Nung is again about taking the. Sorry. I feel like I said this. No, all right, let me just do it. Okay, so then they get into this argument about like who's more charming or seduct, seduct, seducing than the other. And like, Little Nung's like, I'm good at like seducing you. And then Big Nung's like, we're in different leagues, bitch. Uh, uh, oh, actually, she says that after. And then Little Nung's like, um, you're the one who's constantly flustering me and making me squirm and like all this shit. Because like, Here's Big Nung literally rejecting a marriage proposal because she's in love with Little Nung. And like, how did she do it? She was all direct and badass about it. And then Little Nung's like, you expect me not to get turned on by this? I don't, what are you saying? Because like Big Nung's getting all like, what do you mean? Take this seriously. Like, it's not what you think. <laughs> yeah, but this gives Big Nung even more big gay energy. And she tells Little Nung that they are in a different league. To which Little Nung says she will fight back. And yes, she will. Later. In bed. Or in the car right now. Let's see yeah, how this goes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Before she says this, though, Big Nung not, turns on that wicked charm. And she leans across the console. So she's meeting Little Nung, like, at the midway point in the car. So she's more into Little Nung's space. Because that's how Little Nung started this conversation, where she leaned towards Big Nung, and then Big Nung's, like, getting more flustered. So she's doing it back. Because Big Nung is starting to... Because, like, Little Nung has been in control of this conversation for a while, and Big Nung's like, no, no, no. And so she's trying to take it back and, like, make Little Nung flustered. So, and we know from Big Nung's, like, personality, she gets off on being in control with Little Nung, and this is her showing Little Nung that again. And little, I love Little Nung's face when, like, Big Nung does this. She's like, challenge accepted. <laughs> Which is 100% on brand for her. And Big Nung knew that. Because Big Nung... Her, it's, her challenge accepted face is one of my favorite ones. Because we see it multiple times. Yeah. No, that's good. And, like, Big Nung likes that about her. Because... She likes that Little Nung is challenges her constantly and is really persistent. Like that's I will stand by that that was one of the things that attracted her to Little Nung in the first place. So like I what I like about this is that even though they're in like more of a secure relationship stage, I love that that's they they keep that initial attraction going with them like like that's part they're still like flirting based off of those principles, which I like. Yeah, and then Little Nung gets closer to Big Nung and playfully puts her hand on Big Nung's shoulder. And she's really trying to get Big Nung to have to pull this car over because, like, for, let's remember, Big Nung is still driving while all this is going on. Yeah, so this is, like, again, because, like, Big Nung was like, no, I'm more, basically said, I'm more charming than you. That's why she said we're in different leagues, like, and Little Nung's like, oh, yeah, okay. As if I can't charm... The hell out of you. And so that's what she's trying to do. She's trying to prove that she can fluster Big Nung more than Big Nung can fluster her. And they're basically playing the flirting version of chicken, the chicken game in that scene, where like two people or two cars come at each other and like whoever chickens out at the last second before the collision, that's what oh they're God. doing. I don't like that game. That That's terrible. That's basically what they're doing. So basically the Nungs are trying to provoke each other through flirting to see who has the most charm. The winner makes the other one so flustered slash embarrassed that they can't continue the flirting. I wonder who's going to win. Things aren't looking out for Big Nung at this moment because once Little Nung touches her arm and gives her those bedroom eyes, Big Nung stiffens and like leans away. And then she's like, girl, how could you? <laughs> like, what are you doing? I'm driving. She's Just driving. You forgot. <laughs> like, I have both of her lives in my hands right now. <laughs> Yeah, but that's, like, Big Nung's, it, it, while true, it's also an excuse to, like, not yeah. be the flustered one. 
So Little Dong ups the game by stroking Big Nung's shoulder, and then it translates as, like, Arnung. But if you listen to her, that's not what she says. She says Kun Ah. And I think she's short. I think, like, I tried to look it up and see what the hell she was saying, but I think it's, like, a shortening of, like, the ante part. And I think what she's doing is she's, like, saying a more intimate version of Big Nung's, like, the Big Nung name and making it more flirtatious and intimate to fluster Big Nung even more. And the way she, like, says it, it almost sounds the way, like, Mon says Kun Sam. Like, when she's speaking intimately with Sam, it's, like, that very drawn-out, like, sing-songy way she pronounces the word because she's 100% trying to make it intimate to fluster Big Nung even more. Because it's, like, clearly working. Because Big Nung says it again. She's like, bitch, I'm driving. And, and, like, (laughs) and, and, like, okay, but when she's doing this, <laughs> Big Nung again shows her hand. So she, Big Nung, I think this version, like when she says her name like that, I think that's like the bedroom name. And I think that Big Nung can't handle it. And so when she says I'm driving, she unconsciously leans closer to Big Nung, to Little Nung. Whereas before when Little Nung was like touching her and stuff, she was like leaning away. She's like, don't do this. Here, she leans into her. So it's like, Big Nung, did you need to do that? You're making this worse on yourself. This was unnecessary. So, but it's proving Little Nung's point that like, she she does have charm that is capable of entrancing you. And you know, kudos to the masterful flirting. Like, hydrate for lesbian Jesus. Good job, Little Nung. Seriously, Little Nung says, your heart is racing, isn't it? And Big Nung's like, stop, as Little Nung is tracing her fingers down big nung's arm like she is determined to get this car to stop yeah she's determined to prove she's just as charming as big nung is she's like i'm definitely not out of your league i'm gonna prove i'm definitely in your league hence like i'm worthy of you or whatever and so big nung again is getting annoyed quote unquote because she's losing and little nung is still stroking her shoulder at this point which is covered by her sleeve and she's like am i good at this Big Nung doesn't answer that, which means yes. And also you're too good at this because (laughs) the bitch is losing her shit if you watch her like squirming in the seat. And then she's like, like, I'm driving. I'm driving. That's her only excuse. Valid, but still her only excuse. And Little Nung is like, well, what are you going to do? And while she says this, Little Nung ups the flirting. So she moves from tracing Big Nung's shoulder, which is covered by clothing, to her forearm, which is not covered in clothing. So the skin, the skin to skin contact, if you watch, this is where this level of intimacy is Big Nung's breaking point. Yeah, uh, she, this time she doesn't respond by saying she's driving. She just abruptly stops the car. Because what else is In the middle of the street, in the middle of the street. (laughs) She just stops the car. And Little Nung, at this, because I don't think she thought Big Nung was going to do this. She loses every ounce of confidence she just had. And all of her audacity goes flying out the window. Because at this point, she realizes, oh shit, I'm not in control of this like I thought I was. <laughs> because Daddy Nung shows up and has now entered the chat. And Big Nung turns on the intense gay staring. She's like, you want to see my charm? This is the thing I know you can't resist. It's that intense gay staring she does where she's not looking at anything. Mind you, the woman's in the driver's seat. They're in a highway, wherever they are. She's just staring at Little Nug in a, in a car in the middle of the road. How are there and no cars is, behind them honking or anything? Uh, maybe they're on a private road. I don't know. But like, yeah, it, this is wild. And so as she does the intense gay staring, she starts leaning all the way across the console uh, across the mid, you know, midpoint of the car, which forces Little Nung to retreat into her seat. And I mean, she's startled, but also probably excited when she asks, uh, what are you doing? Because let's be real. And all the time that Big Nung has acted as Little Nung's private driver, she's never stopped <laughs> the car in the middle of the road. So like, this is unsettling and new. Yeah, this is new for everybody. This is very new. So to add to the confusion, Big Nung, okay, when Little Nung retreats, Big Nung grabs her and pulls her closer, which completely throws off Little Nung. And she lets out this little like yelp, like the surprise noise, uh, almost like she's like, oh shit, like I'm in trouble. Yes, you have all the charm. Like there's nothing I can do. Like, what am I going to do? Because <laughs> Daddy Nung's here. <laughs> and 
little Nung immediately pulls back and says, I won't do it again. <laughs> like, she's like, I went too far. I didn't know this was going to happen. <laughs> Meanwhile, mind you, Big Nung hasn't said a word. <laughs> she's just staring at little Nung with this teasing smirk. Like, she's silently challenging little Nung to be as bold as she claims to be. And she's like, basically with her eyes, she's like, you want to sing Dress and Kiss Me in public? Well, here's your chance. Here's your chance to be reckless in the middle of this highway. And then Big Nung tells her that she thought she had more guts because that's what Little Nung was portraying this whole time. Yes. And meanwhile, Little Nung's doing nothing. She's just like, what is, she's like lost all the confidence and completely lost her like edge in this conversation. And she's so flustered to the point where she's speechless, which Little Nung never shuts up. So, like, that's the power of Big Nung. And what does she do? Her response is to retreat fully into her seat and just think about what just happened. (laughs) And she's, like, very bashful. She looks so, she's so flustered she can't even handle this because I think she's overwhelmed by just how forward and blunt Big Nung was that it's just, like, It's too much big gay energy for her. Because think about it. The past 24 hours have been a lifetime of big gay energy for little Nung. Like, she just saw Daddy Nung last night and here's Daddy Nung in the morning. Daddy Nung was rejecting her dad. Like, this is a lot, okay? And then Big Nung was like, yes, I will only marry somebody I'm in love with. And she knows that she's in love with her. So, like, and now they're aggressively flirting in the middle of the road. Like... It's a lesbian Jesus miracle that Little Nung is alive because that is a lot of big gay energy in a 24 hour period. Let's, that's a lot. It is, but it's great for us. <laughs> so they separate and then smile the rest of the car ride home because, I mean, they have to get somewhere. Like they can't just stay in the middle of the road. Yes, they cannot. They just can't. And I think the victor of the flirt off is declared. So congratulations, Big Nung. We never doubted you for a second. No, never. No, never. If anyone Little doubted Nung her. Did. <laughs> no. Good job, Big Nung. So they arrive back at the grandmother's house. And Little Nung immediately falls back into being an intimidated child. Like, all confidence that we saw in that car is now gone. And... It's just another example of how she is repressed under her grandmother's control and that the grandmother is trying to gain back this control because she is outside waiting for them and is upset because she expected Little Nung to be with Chet and not Big Nung. Like, I mean, that's that's valid, though. (laughs) Yeah, no, that (laughs) was. What is Big Nung doing here? (laughs) Yeah. Like, I, you're, you're dead, but no one tells me anything. Right. (laughs) Little Nung looks um, to Big Nung for help, and she steps in saying that she showed up to talk to Chet, and Little Nung had asked her to bring her home. We conveniently left out, like, the proposal and, like, all that. Well, I think they were so caught off guard by this question that, again, like, this morning was a clusterfuck, and nobody expected Chet to propose. And so nobody expected them to have to flee Chet's place because he was being weird. So... This was all unplanned. So when the grandmother is like, what, why are you both here together? And when Little Nung looks at Big Nung, Big Nung balks because she really can't explain to Little Nung's grandmother what happened last night. Cause I don't, did anyone tell her that she ran away? And then what happened this morning? So what happens? Big Nung, it's Big Nung that instantly lies to Little Nung's grandmother which we know is something that she hates to do, but this is her version of lying by omission, where she just leaves out information and lets you assume and fill in the blanks, right? So what does she say? She says like, oh, I dropped by to talk to Chet so that Little Nung asked to come back with me instead. Technically, all of that is true. That did happen, but she left out the part where like, you know, literally everything that matters happened. Like, Little Nung ran away from Chet. Big Nung found her. They spent the night together. <laughs> then they went to go see Chet. There was a proposal. She, But she's technically, that this is lying by omission, where she's giving you pieces, but not the full story. And what's interesting about this scene is after Big Nung does this, Little Nung looks guilty. Like, if you look at her, she looks really guilty as Big Nung is 
spin in this lie, basically. Because I think she feels badly for putting Big Nung in these positions where she's lying on her behalf. Because Big Nung is not a person that likes lying. It She really doesn't like it. No, and she's made that clear to Little Nung many times. Yeah. And before she leaves, Big Nung tells Little Nung to call her if anything comes up. And then she respectfully dismisses herself. So, how long till Little Nun called her? Immediately. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I was always like, why does she say this? In f- She's saying it in front of the grandmother, like, out loud. Like, she could have just texted her and been like, if something weird happens, let me know. I think Big Nung is nervous that Chet called the grandmother and told mm. her everything that happened. Particularly, like, the running away part. And I think Big Nung is concerned that the grandmother is going to confront Little Nung privately because you would never, manners say, you would never have this conversation in front of Big Nung, okay? Because Big Nung's the queen, right? And I think she's worried based on past experiences that the grandmother's going to hurt Little Nung. So I think that's why she says out loud to Little Nung, if anything happens, call me. So that one, Little Nung knows, and two, so the grandmother knows. And perhaps if the grandmother thinks, oh, Little Nung will tell Big Nung, the queen, the ML, if I do something, then maybe that will change the grandmother's behavior when they're behind closed doors and she won't do corporal punishment or whatever she was going to do. Because if you watch Big Nung after she excuses herself, she gets in the car and then looks at Little Nung and like, she looks concerned and scared like she doesn't want to leave little nung and i think it's she's worried what the grandmother's gonna do yeah exactly that's what i thought too because i was like i mean she just definitely does not want to leave her right now no i think she's worried chet because chet's snitching a bunch of stuff to people he's a little bitch so because he listens to enough that he wants to and like he remembers select things he's a child um also like i don't think big nung yeah there's that and also i know big nung's like i don't know who he called last night when she ran away yeah like he could have like like, reasonably called the grandmother and be like she with you like you know what i mean yeah the grandmother definitely would not be happy right right um so when uh, big nung leaves the grandmother and little nung head inside the house and this is where the left luggage comes back up. The grandmother questions where Little Nung's bag is. And as normal, a lie comes very easy to Little Nung. And she tells her that her dad will bring it by later. Which <laughs> is true. That's lying by omission. That's Big Nung style. Like, he kind of has to return it to her. But he didn't volunteer to do that. <laughs> and at this point, I didn't think she had bags. I, don't, I thought it was just like a full-on lie. Um, so I was like, I didn't think he was going to come by at all. And I'm like, I hope she forgets. I feel like, does he drop it off? Because, or would little Big Nung go pick it up? I don't know. Who knows? I don't think Big Nung wants to see his ass. I don't think Little Nung wants her shit back. She's like, he'll bring it by (laughs) whenever. Just burn it. (laughs) Exactly. The grandmother then asks how the trip was with her dad. And... Little Nun responds that she isn't close to that family and she felt uncomfortable. And that's why she didn't want to stay there any longer. And, like, I mean, it was your first time meeting them. And I know Chet is their son, but they might be just decent people. Because I just love how excited that grandmother was to meet her and see her. It was so cute. But unfortunately, we have this grandmother. And this grandmother yes. scolds her and tells her she can't say things like that again because other people will blame her for her not teaching Little Nung manners. And it's not because Little Nung might like to have a relationship with them one day. That's not like, that's Big Nung's concern about everything. It's because Little Nung's making the grandmother look bad right now. And of course, it's not what's best for Little Nung because it never is. It's not even, like, what's best for her. It's, like, think of the point of view. The point of view is not, oh, your happiness. It's my happiness. You know what I mean? It's about yeah. me projecting onto you versus, like, you and your well-being. You know, like, and but to your point, like, yeah, the first time you're going to meet these people is going to be awkward. So, like, it was weird to force her to spend 
the night with them. You know what I mean? Like, if Chet actually gave a shit about introducing his family to Little Nung, it's like, have dinner at our place. Which I guess he did try to do a bunch of times, and she kept saying no. But I still think that um, they should have gone to a third location. Right. No, I agree. I agree. And, I agree. But yeah. I, I think, like, culturally, it's more like, come to our mm. home so we can That's take right. care of you. It's like guest rights and all that kind of stuff. It's impersonal to take people to a restaurant. Like, you know what I mean? It's Whereas cooking is a form of love. You know? That makes so, sense. Like, yes. Yeah, I, I think continue to forget the differences. Yeah. Like, it's just, it's a cultural thing. Like, I understand. My culture's like that, too. So, like, I think that's why they're they're trying. Because they want to welcome her as a family member, not just show somebody a good time yeah. kind of thing. But, like, you are dealing with it, which Chet doesn't know because he doesn't care. But you are dealing with a very introverted person who, you know, spent most of her life isolated. And, like, it's hard for her. And, you know. So I think that's why, like, having Big Nung, like, quote, a friend with her. Maybe, like, invite folk with, you know, like, give her a friend. Like, somebody to, like make her confident it doesn't have poor to be folk, big nung. but <laughs> i know poor folk, do it. like let her bring a friend i mean i would say yeah. Yui, but he would never let her bring yui but like you know what i That's mean true. like let her bring a friend but then it's like it's not family if, you know i know it gets complicated but like and he would never think about that in the first place either well exactly that's the problem yeah exactly but, you know, the, to the grandmother's point, like, it is, like, I understand where she's coming from. She's like, it is not polite if you're, like, trashing your family. You know what I mean? She's like, also, like, I will get blamed for being the one who didn't teach you, regardless of how you feel, though I'm in trouble. You know what I mean? She's like, we got to play the politics game here. But poor little Nung is just, she's tired over it, you know? I don't blame her. I don't blame her either. This was a lot. Little Nung just says that she is sorry and she won't go next time. And then, which is true, <laughs> yeah. But then she corrects herself by saying she won't say it again. But she definitely means she's not going to go again. Yeah, like if you watch her in this conversation, Little Nung is struggling to play the role of like dutiful granddaughter because that's what the grandmother expects. And to me, this is Big Nung's impact because when she's with Big Nung, she's in a safe space to express her feelings, no matter what they are. Uh, so even when they disagree, Little Nung is still feels comfortable with expressing herself to Big Nung. And because she spends so much time with Big Nung, it's getting harder for her to play this game of faking it that she's had to play her entire life for her own, like, physical and emotional well-being, you know? Yeah, I mean, we've definitely seen it, especially in the second season, like, the more time that she's separated from this house, she's coming into her own person you yep. see her more comfortable. She's more relaxed yep. until we get here into this house. I mean, <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. It's it's like, yeah. you know, they regress when they're in their childhood environments. And also, like, it's not just the environment for Little Nung. The people in the environment are tr- treating her like a child. And she's like, I am not a child anymore. No, she is not a child. She's a full grown woman now. Yeah, she is. The, the grandmother tells her that she is so stubborn. And here, stubborn just means that Little Nung has her own thoughts and opinions, which is not allowed in this house. Right. She's just independent. (laughs) That is, insert independent. And the grandmother makes things worse by saying it would be good if Big Nung married her dad. So she could keep her under control. So did Chet call her right after the proposal rejection, maybe? Right. This is like, okay. Because like, all right. So Little Nung's response to this is a little fucking surprise that this is coming out of her grandmother's mouth. So I think this is the first time the grandmother has ever said anything along these lines. So I I was also wondering, is Little Nung thinking in this scene, oh shit, did my dad call and tell you about his plan to wife Big Nung? Because Little Nung does know he gossips with her grandmother. So that's how the grandmother found out about Yui. So it's not implausible that he let the grandmother in on the pl- on the plan okay it's not improbable that he like chet didn't call the grandmother to talk about this because he tells her things and like if you think about it if this was any kind of traditional whatever like the chet chet would have to talk to like big nung's relative to be like i want to marry her but there's no relatives anymore it's just big nung and he of course he doesn't tell big nung and he's not gonna go to sam because he forgets sam's a person so i think he's doing it in little nung's family because like 
again, he, she's he's going to her family to be like, well, I'm going to get a new wife. What do you think about me wifing big? So like he would have to go to elders to be like, are you cool with this plan? So I think he probably did off screen be like, hey, I'm planning on doing this. So maybe that's why the grandmother's like, why are you guys here together? I thought Chet was wifing you. <laughs> It's like, where, where is Chet? Like, if you're here, then he has to be here, too. And then, like, okay, I like the rest of the line. Because like, why does the grandmother want Little Nung uh, to be under Big Nung's dominion as stepmother? Because she's like, she needs to get you under control. And it's like, man, Big Nung does have things under control when it comes to her. Just not in the way you think. <laughs> oh, the control is great. The control has so much big gay energy. It's ridiculous. And then, since Little Nung has already spoke her mind to Chet earlier, she's just going to continue that. And she says that she never wants Big Nung to be her stepmom. And the grandmother actually looks surprised by this, because from her view, Big Nung is a stand-in mom for her. And it seems like she likes having her around. Like, there's a reason why she spends so much time with her. I mean, it never crosses her mind that they're lovers, but... But I do, because, like, at the end of the scene, she looks genuinely confused. And I do wonder what she is putting together when it comes to Big Nung and Little Nung. Because, like, think about it. They showed up together when they weren't supposed to. Little Nung has no luggage. Like, this was all super suspicious. They spend a lot of time together. Little Nung has nobody. She's dating. Like, I don't know. There's a lot of weird shit going on. And then, like, I don't know. I just wonder They're really the not good at doing. subtlety either. It's no. just... If anybody really thought about it, everyone would know. Correct. Then we head over to the emotional support lesbians. Because Big Nung definitely needs emotional support right now. Absolutely. And everything is so overwhelming. So what do we do? We must stare at water. Because that is what we do when life is overwhelming. And by that I mean they are sitting on the edge of Sam and Mon's pool. And this is exactly why Sam insisted they have a pool for moments like this. Yes. I could just see them, like, actually playing, like, I need to look at water. Yeah. Sam's like, the pool goes here. And Mon's like, we don't even use the pool, Sam. (laughs) Sam's like, the pool goes here, Mon. Mon's like, okay. Hold on. No, Sam's like, remember that one night that we had in that pool? We need a pool. The pool goes there, Mon. Mon's like, all right, sure. That was a good night. Go watch Gap. (laughs) (laughs) That was was Mon's boss. That was the Mon boss episode. Yeah. Sam jokes that Big Nung is. Hold on. Okay. So Sam jokes that Big Nung something because she got proposed to by the same man twice. I mean, she is Big Nung. Like, you I mean, do, she's you, Big Nung. Yeah, like, big nung. duh. Only twice? What? <laughs> <laughs> Only twice. Again, she ran away. Never gonna happen. <laughs> but Big Nung tells her that this is not the time to joke. <laughs> Sam is always joking around with her sister. And she's like, this is not where I come to my emotional support lesbians. I need you to talk to me. I need you to not be you for five seconds. I'm really here to see Mon. <laughs> Yes, Mon. Are you taking patience today? Um, and she tells them that Chet is stubborn. Like, again, he she ran away. He still didn't learn. And she explains that she rejected him again. But he still doesn't seem to understand because he's Chet. Also, like, why are men like this in general? Like, uh, we've seen so many of these... Thai girl love shows why are the men always like this where they can't they don't listen when the rejection happens and they're always like it's fine I can wait forever for you to change your mind and the woman's like I'm not gonna change my mind can you move on and find happiness elsewhere stop trying to chase me I don't want you to chase me just go away chase somebody else I'm a lesbian and are always like no I must chase you who wins in that scenario everybody loses you know like that's toxic. It is. Is this a common thing, like, for men to just not take no for the answer? Or is this just the author writing? Men? I mean, men are like this everywhere, where they don't take That's no true. for an answer. But, like, 
They seem weirdly persistent about the marriage stuff here, where they're like, I'll mm-hmm. wait forever because the elders want us to marriage. marry, which I understand the mentality, but it's like then the men are unhappy too because then they're like in this position where like they're just waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and getting rejected over and over. That can't be good for their psyche, you know. Not that Chet is in that category. He's just not listening to anybody. But I mean, like in general, I'm just making a point. Like, they, they, like they're unhappy too, you know? And like the women are like, can you stop chasing me? I don't want this. You don't want that. Like, what are we doing, everybody? Like, I don't know. Why I'm are just we throwing here? that out there. I don't expect an answer for that. So Sam asks why she doesn't just tell him that she is dating little Nung. It's just simple. Just tell them that you're dating his daughter. I don't know, Sam, when you were with Mon, why didn't you just tell your grandmother you were dating Mon? <laughs> I, like, Sam, you've been through this, ma'am. Don't you remember? Do you have amnesia from Gap? Like, <laughs> To which both Mon and Big Nung shout at her that she can't. <laughs> and like, even Mon's like, what the hell are you talking about? Go inside. <laughs> Your advice, right, Sam? Just go away. Right now, they should have sent Sam out for snacks and be like, "Sam, can you go get us some snacks and spend money?" And Sam would be like, "Yes." And then like Mon talks to Big Nut because like Sam's not helpful because she has amnesia from her own life in this conversation. (laughs) Yeah, she has amnesia in this show from her her own life. From her own life. (laughs) But with Mon also saying that she can't. Okay. So Mon tells Sam that if Big Nung does tell them about Little Nung, then Little Nung's family will be doomed. And now Big Nung's fears are validated because even someone on the outside of this family could see that this is the issue. So it's just, it's not making things better. And she's like, I'm right to feel this right now. So this is why we're here, Mon, fix it. (laughs) Yeah, and it's it's interesting, but also not fully surprising that it's Mon that points this out because Mon has the brain cell always. <laughs> but it's really, again, baffling to me how much of an optimist Sam is in this scene because basically Sam's mentality is like, oh, love will conquer all, which has been Little Nung's stance the whole time. So she's more like in the mindset of Little Nung when it comes to viewing the relationship, whereas Mon and Big Nung are being pragmatic and understand like the intricacies of navigating this relationship. Again, how Sam has amnesia about her own relationship drama, I don't understand. But like Mon seems to remember what the the hell they went through to get where they are now. I think Sam has like rose colored glasses for hindsight where she's like, it was fine. It worked out, Mon. And Mon's like, do you not remember <laughs> dating you took 20 years off my life? Like, <laughs> Well, that's because Mon was the one crying at I know. the beginning and end of Mon every was the episode. One, Mon was the one upset constantly. Yeah. And Mon was the one. But also like it wasn't. It's also interesting because Mon's family wasn't the problem. It was Sam's family. So like really like Mon was in Big Nung's position in Gap where she's like, if our relationship comes out, it's going to cause issues with Sam's family, which it did. And like Sam was always being like the one like, I'll tell her eventually. <laughs> I'll tell my grandmother <laughs> eventually. eventually. <laughs> and, I'll you tell know. Kirk eventually <laughs> fuck that guy oh how she tells kirk was always funny if you haven't seen gab that was one of my favorite moments where she tells her fiance what the hell that was so funny <laughs> anyway <laughs> sam was an asshole sometimes but that was really fucking funny um but yeah so it's, it's interesting because like mon was basically nung in that relationship so she's like i understand where nung's coming from it's not as easy as being like we're dating deal with it like you have to ease people into it like how did mon and sam get through it They kind of had to ease the grandmother into it in a way to like, it took a while to be like, yeah, we're dating for real. And then like show the grandmother how devoted they were and like all that kind of stuff. So like, I think Mon's like, I understand Nung is trying to navigate it without it being so explosive because in Gap it was explosive because of Nung. (laughs) Because of Nung. And like Nung came in guns blazing and made it explosive. But like, (laughs) here we are later where Nung's like, okay, that was bad. Let's try not to do that. So I think Mon empathizes with Nung the most in this scene, and no- Sam just has amnesia. <laughs> Sam-, Sam is the most comedic relief in this show. She's so um, funny. I mean, Sam is the comedic relief, period. She's the comedic relief of Gab, too. She's really funny. She's great. I mean, her best friend's Jim. <laughs> her first friend's Jim. Who would not be helpful in this scene. No. Oh my no. gosh. What would Jim's advice be? 
Do you want me to fight? Remember how Jim? Remember how Jim was always like, if you're gonna go see the grandmother, make sure you're armed to the teeth. I think she'd give the same advice. She'd be like, you want to go tell them? Just make sure you're armed to the teeth and ready for a battle. It's like Jim. I'll awful. have the alcohol ready for you when you get home. Right. I mean, they have alcohol in this scene, so like Jim would have brought. I don't even know what she would have brought to this. She'd be like, get everybody else drunk and then tell them. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not bad huh. advice. <laughs> well, actually, that might work. Unless they're very mean drunks, because that could be counteractive. That could be a counter uh, counterproductive. Yeah. Anyway, um, we'll never know. Yeah. So Big Nung explains to Sam that Chet would never accept it if she were to tell him, and then brings up how he made a big deal about Little Nung possibly dating Yui. I mean, poor Yui, because Yui is now being used. Like, Yui exists, and they're pissed off. Yui's a pawn in all of this. Yui's just a pawn. But I think that Big Nung, because of all the things, because of her, you know, what her and Mon just expressed, that, like, I can't just flat out say it. This is going to take time to ease people into this. And Big Nung, we have seen her working tirelessly to open Chet's mind about the queerness. So first of all, he can be a loving father and actually accept his queer daughter for who she is. So A, Little Nung gets that acceptance, which is the only thing she wants. And two, if he can accept Little Nung's identity, then he can eventually accept Little Nung being in a relationship with her. And that way in Big Nung's mind, they're doing it quote, the right way, which is involving the family and knowing about them. But like, at this point, she can't just say that because it'll explode. That's what happened in Gap. So she's like, first of all, we have to deal with the fact that you guys are homophobic and get you to not be homophobic. Then you can accept our relationship. The problem is that Chet has proven to be useless time and time again. And clearly, at this point, Chet has influence over Little Nung's whole family. Like, the grandmother listens to him, which she shouldn't. And Big Nung knows he's the linchpin to the family because he's the head of he's the man he's like the head of the family or whatever even if he's not actually fulfilling that role like in the structure that's who she has to charm and he's the one that if he, she can get him on board he can get the grandmother on board pinkfa is like in the picture but not really because she's not physically here so she doesn't really hold as much sway chat unfortunately is physically in thailand and is kind of like more of a pressing matter and also i feel like big nun's like she was into me i feel like the homophobia is less with her we can work on her later <laughs> the problem is chet and then the grandmother okay the other thing about this scene that's great is that while she's talking to Mon and Sam, Big Nung openly admits to them she is in a, quote, relationship with Little Nung. She uses that word. And you know who doesn't know Big Nung thinks they are in a relationship? Little Nung. But here she is telling her emotional support lesbians that Little Nung's her girlfriend. That's what she's saying in this scene. So put a pin in that because... Big Nung, Sam's house is a safe space, and she feels comfortable enough telling them that. She hasn't told the girlfriend yet. <laughs> it's just, it's like this family to tell the sister before the girlfriend. Right. Because it's too scary to tell the girlfriend because that makes it real. Versus she could tell the emotional support lesbians because this is a safe space and they're being sad by a pool, which is fine, right? So then when... <laughs> Then when the UE part comes up, I love this. So when she asks Sam, she's like, she says, Sam, do you remember Yui? And when Big Nung says this, Sam and Mon in unison both nod yes. Mon doesn't know Yui. <laughs> <laughs> Mon never met Yui. So I love that Sam and Mon are the same person in the scene. And they're both like, like, Mon, she wasn't talking to you. <laughs> Mon knows it, all it, about Yui. <laughs> Yeah, it implies that she knows Yui from Sam, but I just love that they're both like, yes. And it's like, Mon, you never met this woman. <laughs> you never met Yui. <laughs> Unless they had a really weird run-in that we did not see. I think that Sam came back from that really weird meeting with Yui, and she's like, Mon, you're never going to believe Where Sam day. was left alone with Yui. <laughs> right, with Yui. Right. And they had that whole conversation that we made up. Um, and bought the drinks because Sam was awkward. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Big Nung also says that if Chet knew the truth, he might die from a heart attack, <laughs> which, I mean, maybe we should tell him. 
I mean, if you can get rid of him, that would solve a lot of problems. It really would. I love that she's with a heart attack, though, because, like, that was the Grandman's trigger, like, in Gap. So, them tickers, man. I mean, that's a a lot of the shows <laughs> watching. You gotta take care of your hearts, everyone. But I think the reason she says this is that she's worried about harming someone else based on her own selfish actions. Like, that's something she's been grappling with the whole time. That was the song thing and the grandmam stuff. And so, like, she's trying not to have history repeat itself because of things that she's doing. So, like, it's admirable that she's, like, thinking these things and trying to be proactive about sticky situations and not just, again, guns blazing. Let me just take what I want. Fuck everybody else, you know? Yeah, the, the growth is amazing, especially yes. when you see from Gap to now. Yes. Sam responds that the outcome of her telling them about the relationship is not going to, uh, is just going to be the same whether she tells him now or in five years. And like, yeah, but also like Theora said in previous episodes, it's not quite true because Little Nug would be out of school and things would be a little different. Like, the outcome of, like, them dating is going to be the same. But it's not true because of that. But also, like, again, these people need time to just accept Little Nug for who she is. If they can accept her, which is going to take time because they're... Because, like, if you remember in the... Both Pinkfa and Chet, when they were grilled on whether or not they would allow, for whatever, allow Little Nung to date a woman. Remember, uh, uh, the first reaction was fear, anger, and then when they got asked it again after getting their emotions out, both of them said, I don't know. So, like, they need time to think about it. That's all it is. So, like, it's not a no, it's an I don't know, right? So I think the thought is, like, if it's five years from now and they've gotten past the concept of their daughter being queer then that does change the scenario then we also have to deal with do you want to date your stepmom or whatever (laughs) like that's another problem right you know what i mean it's still gonna have its bumps but like the queerness has to at least one of these things is dealt with like you know what i mean yeah (laughs) yeah so like it it may not make it as explosive you know okay all right so then when sam says that big nung the outcome thing. Big Nung thinks about it and then replies, some truths are hard to accept. Projection, your honor, because Big Nung has been having a hard time accepting all of this the whole show. And Big Nung and Little Nung have fought tooth and nail to accept who they are and have others accept them in return. Like, that's kind of the arc they're on right now. And I think Sam and Mon know this too because they also fought like hell for their relationship maybe this is a gay thing (laughs) (laughs) it's like you you have to fight just to be who you are or this is the the gap universe thing everyone's doing this okay but then big nong gets to the crux of it all and she says really what this is all about is she doesn't want little nong to go through the same familial hardships that she went through when she left the palace and she's like especially with the grandmother because i know how much she loves her grandmother and i love this so much because again this is big nung the growth of big nung and she's using the lessons she learned to try her damnedest to spare a little long from like trauma because i think she's gonna live with her trauma from the grandmother from the grandmam forever and it's just like also, Little Nung has enough trauma going on, so. Correct. I mean, so did Big Nung, but. <laughs> I mean, no, she does, but she's like, if I can spare her anymore. Yeah, but this is Big Nung basically saying, I don't want her to go through what I went through. Because I think she's still feeling the pain of all that still. And, but Sam points out the difference. She's like, well, Little Nung's not going to go through that alone like you did because Little Nung has you. So she's going to have somebody with her, which Big Nung never had. You know, Big Nung went through all that shit kind of basically alone. She, yeah, she has her sisters, but it's not like the same thing. And I think on some level, Big Nung knows this because she would never let Little Nung face this by herself. Like, she's constantly trying to protect her where she can. And I wonder if in hindsight, like, Big Nung really wishes that she didn't have to face so many challenges in her life alone. But the flip side of this statement is also true. Like, Big Nung is also just not alone either. 
And, I, you know, she has Little Nung now. She also doesn't have to face life alone anymore or big challenges or whatever. And I think on some level, Big Nung knows that. And it, it adds to her terror of losing Little Nung, especially to all this family drama. I think that's the other reason where you're like, wow, why can't we just get this over with? Why can't they just confront them? I think Big Nung is terrified of the possibility of losing Little Nung to her family. And so she's trying to put it off, too, because she's like, selfishly, she's like, I want her in my life and I'm afraid I'll lose her when this comes out. And that's totally understandable. You know, and, and the other thing about it too, is if their relationship comes to light, like, like we keep saying, it's this beautiful, healthy relationship that they, these two women have just found for the first time in their lives. And Big Nung is worried that either Little Nung will be taken away from her by the family or once they go through this hardship with the family, it's very possible that their relationship will be altered in a not good way, potentially forever, just by going through this kind of trauma. Like, whether that change is some kind of fracture between Little Nung and the grandmother, and Little Nung now will have to carry that forever the way Big Nung carries her grandmam trauma, or it's possible that something will shift between Big Nung and Little Nung that can never be undone. And so the uncertainty of all of that is also like tearing Big Nung apart. There's a lot of unknowns to this and possible bad outcomes to this beautiful relationship she has. And I think she's really terrified of altering it. Which is totally valid for, I mean, all these reasons. Big Nung's going through a lot right now. And she, that's why we need the emotional support lesbians. That's why we need them. So then she says about Little Nung, Little Nung won't be able to handle fighting with the grandmother, which is more projection from Big Nung. <laughs> the biggest, the biggest projection yet. The biggest. And if, you, if you'd watched Big Nung up till now, she has been trying to prepare Little Nung for this possibility, like the confrontation with the grandmother. But despite that, Little Nung really seems unprepared for it. And... This is Big Nung speaking from experience. Like, I, there's never a way to fully prepare yourself for that, but, like, you can be more prepared than, than not. I don't know if Big Nung will ever be fully able to move past what happened in her past because there's always going to be those what-ifs in her mind because she's trying to spare Little Nung from losing her grandmother, but, like, what if she had done something differently and she had a relationship with her grandmother it's hard like you can it can dull over time but there's always like a random day you're gonna be like well what if i just done that yeah and that's like the biggest problem i have with the grandmam is that she robbed nung of any kind of resolution of their bullshit basically by refusing to talk to nung about it and so big nung now is gonna have to carry the what ifs, like you said, forever, because she never had closure. Never, never has it. And so I think she will always carry that forever. And like you said, like it won't be a constant, you know, thing every single day, but she's going to have days where she's going to have to like relive the trauma or process it all over again. It's like she's going to have some level of PTSD from this, basically. So, which is unfortunate. But in this scene, Big Nong, again, why is she here? She's here to see her emotional support lesbians who are comforting her. And I want to talk about like their body language in this scene because I think it's really funny. So after Big Nong like basically spits out her truth, the emotional support lesbians are there to comfort each other. And so I love this, the shot of them immediately after that. So it's Big Nong drinking away her feelings. Sam is comforting Big Nong while Mon is comforting Sam. <laughs> so, <laughs> which I love. So it's like this like, tag of like everyone's comforting each other which like sam doesn't need cover in the scene so i love mon could have sat on the other side of nung and they both could be comforting nung but no it's mon on hand on sam sam hand on nung i love that it's but this is like it's a comforting train where right Bing doesn't have to comfort anyone and mon's basically comforting everyone so that's right. just the roles <laughs> that is true that is dynamic true. nung is comforting herself by drinking the wine <laughs> so go she's get comforting the wine nung. glass she is also, could we talk about how they're, like, color-coded in the scene? So, like, Mon's in, like, a cream color or, like, a white, if you'll say, like, pure white. Sam is in white and then black shorts and Nung's in the black. So, like... <laughs> that's, that's... I do love that. That's very true. I love it. They're, they're kind it's of like, complimenting. Like, let's gradient them. 
Well, it's like polar opposites. Sam and Ma- uh, Mon and uh, Nong, and then Sam's in the middle, literally oh, with the colors, and m- literally in the middle. How? I, however, I. F- I feel like Mon should be the one in the middle. Anyway. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Like, Sam was useless in the scene. But anyway, like, no, I love Sam. So, okay. So they're doing the, the train of comforting. And Sam reassures Big Nung that she believes in her. And this is Sam's way of showing Big Nung that she also isn't alone. It's not just Little Nung that is keeping Big Nung from being alone. It's also her family, like her emotional support lesbians. She has people to back her up that love her. And I think in the past, Big Nung felt alone when she was waging the war with the Grand Man because Big Nung, Nung number one, was isolated in her sis- from her sisters as the eldest child by the Grand Man, by the way the Grand Man, you know, raised her to be in her spitting image, to be the heir. She put way more pressure on her. That's like part of eldest child syndrome. Like Big Nung has that in spades. Where she had more responsibilities put on her because she was the oldest. And so because of that, her life experiences in the palace is different than that of Song and Sam's. And since that was Big Nung's experience, and now she's about to face a similar situation to her past with Little Nung, I think her trauma is being triggered a bit here. And Sam maybe senses that shift in Big Nung. And is doing her best to be supportive. And also Mon, by extension, because, like, Mon's just empathetic, period. Mon is a great person. She is. Mon's gone through so much shit. And she's still here supporting everybody. (laughs) It's why you cannot cut Mon out of any of these wills. She earned everything by being there for you two bitches. Mon gets half of Everything. Everything. Like when Nung kicks it, Mon gets something. <laughs> I'm just saying. Mon gets something. the queen title. <laughs> like, give her something. So I love that Big Nung gets this kind of validation and support from Mon, uh, from Mon and Sam. And I think, and then she thanks Sam and Mon for their support, which is also big for Big Nung to even say that. And like, they're, they really are a healthy family unit. And I'm really glad we get moments like this on screen with them. It's really sweet, and I, I do enjoy that. I just love seeing Big Nung supported. Because for so long she wasn't, and it's not because Sam didn't support her. It's because she was a child. <laughs> they were children. Yeah. Um, also, like, Nung ran away, isolated herself even more, and, like, Sam couldn't support her until they crashed into each other's lives again. So, but I just love it. They're like a found family, kind of in a way, like with Mon, and they act like a a healthy family, which I do enjoy, since given the way these sisters were raised. So I like they Mm -hmm. have that now. And at the end of this conversation, Big Nung initiates a cheers with the wine glasses, which is also super sweet. Like, they're just, I don't know, they're just being cute. Okay, but if you watch the end of this... My favorite part is that they do everything perfectly in sync. Like, they stop drinking the glass, and then they all put it down at the same time. And I just find it very hilarious that they're all in sync right now. They're so much alike. I love that so much. Later that evening, maybe, what is time, Big Nung returns to the Bua Palace. And the first thing we see in this, is it her room? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's her room. Uh, we see a family portrait. And I was looking at this. Big Nung and the Grand Vam have similar expressions where there is barely a smile there. And they're pretty serious in the photo. Sam and Song have more of a smile. You can definitely tell the next in line through this photo. It also re- reiterates that Big Nung was actually a lot like with the Grand Ma- the Grand Ma'am. Like, you could just fully say, I love, it was just so interesting to see, like, the difference in the dynamic depending on the order. Yeah, that's a really good read. Like, we've seen personality-wise that for all the bullshit, Nung and the Grand Mam are very similar, were very similar, which is why they butted heads. So it's it's cute to see that, like, Song and Sam were more similar, <laughs> which is cute, because we get so little of Song. Yeah, so, yeah, we could basically be like, oh, Song was just a quieter version of Sam. Yeah, no, literally, because, like, Song is, uh, like, described by Big Nung as, like, the cute, nice sister. Like, so is Sam. Like, Sam is honestly, like, like, so is Sam. But, I mean, 
Sam is also very blunt and direct sometimes, but like Sam is very sweet. If you could, if you use that language also, like she's very caring and loving and I assume Sam was similar. Okay. I wonder what Thank you, Caitlin. this family would be like if Song was still here. Like, I literally want the Song story where it's just like in, like, it's just the years where Song was alive. And then it could just mm-hmm. end with, like, Song's contemplation of ending it all and just, like, end the story. But I would love to see, like, from the the girl, like, a little bit of the girls with their parents and then, like, the accident. And then them coming into the custody of the grandmam yeah. and then them going through that up to the, up to Nung leaving. And then it could just be like Song and Sam being like, what are we going to do? And it just, the book ends. Like, we don't have to, like, get to the end of Song, but, like, just that time period from Song's point of view would be amazing. Do we know what age the parents' stuff happened? I don't, I have no idea. I don't, I don't remember. It might have been in blank, but I don't remember. I want to know more about that. Like, what age did they come to the grandmam? I know Song, Sam was too little to remember anything. Nung remembered stuff. Maybe eight. She may have been eight. I feel like it was in blank, but I just can't remember off the top of my head. But dude, they were children. All of them were children. Sam was a baby baby, though. So Sam doesn't even know her parents. That's so sad. I don't know how much Song remembered either, but... Anyway, so why are we here? So we're in Big Nung's room, where she finds a big box from Little Nung. And inside the box is a card and a stuffed animal. And, like, kudos to Big Nung, because she reads the card first before getting the gift. That's love. That's and love, bitch. <laughs> that's love, bitch. And what's in the card? So Little Nung wrote her this really sweet message. It says, happy birthday. You are the one I love most in the world. You should try squeezing the hand of this doll, which is not intuitive. You know, it's a human doll, not a for a dog where you, like, <laughs> go for the squeaker. So what's in the box? So it's a giant puppy dog stuffed animal. Which is Little Nung in stuffed animal form. Because of course, because Little Nung had to outdo what Big Nung did for her birthday. When Big Nung got her the little black cat plushie. So she gets her, not only does she get her, her, which is Big Nung in plushie form. So she gets Big Nung herself in plushie form. But outdoes her because it's bigger. It's a huge box. And also it talks. So she like totally outdoes Big Nung. I could just see them trying to one-up each other every anniversary. (laughs) Oh, for sure. For sure. For sure. And it's also, like, the perfect gift because, you know, why did Big Nung get it for Little... Get Little Nung the cat? It's because she's like, you need something to hug when I'm not there. And, like, these two are so similar. Little Nung's like, I'm sure you also need something to hug in general when I'm not there. So she's like, let me just be more explicit about the fact that this is me and a stuffed animal because I'm going to talk to you in it. So when she hits the voice recording... It essentially mirrors exactly exactly why Big Nung gifted Little Nung the black cat plushie. Because she's like, in case you miss me, you'll have the doggy. Just hug it. And also, like, it says in it, like, I love you. I belong to you. That kind of stuff. So it's, like, not only, like, the sentiment of, like, hug this when you're sad. Because Big Nung does need physical touch. And Little Nung knows that. Even though Big Nung will never admit it. Big Nung also needs that reassurance that she's loved. So I think that's why Big Little Nung also, like, adds that but also when you know what happens later in blank this is a little bit of foreshadowing it's like hey if i'm not there for some reason (laughs) here's my voice and a stuffed animal that you can hug yeah don't don't give someone something just in case because then it's gonna happen yeah Um, but i mean to be fair they're also like not together all the time because little dog is in school or whatever but anyway like to go back to the end of the message, the end of the message is really sweet where she's like, I will always love you from Little Nung who belongs to Big Nung. Like, it's very, very sweet. Yeah. The So this whole message that she's doing is like very mission-based sounding, like very like, I'm here for a reason. Until she gets to saying Big Nung's name. And it sounds like the sweetest thing ever. And I just don't think Little Nung is capable of saying her name any other way. Like, it always has to, it's like that sing-songy. Oh, yeah, how she says it, yeah. Yeah. It's very sweet. The way she says the message, too, it sounds, like, Yoko kind of used a voice for Little Nung that she would use in season one a lot, too. That, like, yeah. I like, the way she says it, it sounds like season one Little Nung. Again, demonstrating that, like, her feelings never change, like, you know. 
Like, I'm still who I was. Yeah. So what does Big Nung do? Big Nung melts immediately and treats the doll like Little Nung. So she grabs it, then gently kisses its forehead and hugs it like it's the most precious thing in the world. So to me, this behavior is Big Nung admitting Little Nung does know her best because she likes her Little Nung hugs and like, here she is. And then I was watching this and I'm like, could you imagine Big Nung doing anything like this in the beginning of the series, this series, or even Gap? Like, no. I mean, the closest thing we get to this is she does have a stuffed animal that she sleeps with that must be from her childhood. It's like a little rabbit that's like Mm -hmm. in that bed. And she does like when she's sad, hold it and like cry. So that's like the, but this where she's like smiling and kissing its forehead, like no, that she would never do that because she never had these feelings before. She was incapable of this because she didn't know what it meant. Valid. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i think if anything we'd get scenes like the loyal pin with the sasha bunny or <laughs> like strangling the damn thing when she's upset <laughs> i forgot about that, that is, never that forget that scene. that's a thing that happened <laughs> that's amazing um, all right so after big nung hugs little nung the doll version we cut over to a new day at the art gallery where Juan viva took big nung up on the art lesson deal but not the private art lesson, because Little Nung would hijack the mob to get rid of her if that ever happened. <laughs> so Juan is like, all right, I'll take that art lesson. And Big Nung's like, okay, cool. You have to bring people with you. <laughs> yeah. My wife finds out she'll kill you. Like, literally kill you. So during the group workshop, some of Juan Viva's friends start gossiping about a mutual friend named Amp, who's dating a man 10 years younger than her. Good for her. Yeah, but it's quite interesting to be witnessing gossip that has nothing to do with the characters in the show. Like, obviously, it's there to make Big Nung insecure about the topic. But I do find it fascinating that this is done by overhearing gossip than, like, having her directly in a conversation. I mean, I was sleep deprived while writing these notes. Um, But I don't think gossiping is a fairly common thing like in these shows unless you're part of the diversity pop staff because those those people yeah they're 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 the worst that's from gap if you don't know okay so i think it's normal because like they're having a it's a private lesson in a way where like the gallery is only open to this friend group so like they're talking about like i assume these are juan viva's doctor friends or something so they're talking about a mutual friend just amongst themselves and being like did you guys hear about this and big nun just happens to be there because she owns the fucking place and is i guess giving them a lesson i don't know because nobody's drawing the same thing so i don't know what this is to be honest um I just thought it was cool that we heard about these people that we don't know. Yeah, no, it's just, and I think, yeah, it's to your point, it's to reinforce that, like, no matter who's involved, the age gap thing is stigmatized. Because, like, there's stigma because, with Big Nung and Little Nung, because she almost married Little Nung's dad. She's a princess. Little Nung is just out of school. But, like, here's it being enforced that, like, this is, there's a stigma no matter what. Even with straight people. It's like, there's no gay thing. It's amp. And her boyfriend. So this is straight people. Assume We don't know anyone's about sexuality, but it's a hetero appearing couple. So like, we're just, we're dealing with one aspect of their, the fuckery that's happening here. And one of the things that, that comes up is they're like, oh my God, a 10 year age gap, will they make it? And so like, oof, does that- Big Nung that... immediately pauses when she hears that too. Yeah. That's that hits the nail on the head when it comes to Big Nung's insecurity. And so she like feels really secondhand judged slash insecure about this really her relationship with Little Nung. Like it all starts like bubbling to the surface. And then one part where they keep talking, the group of friends, they then say that's a huge age gap. 10 years. Now, mind you, their age gap is 16. And the friends say they probably talk about completely different things. And this line in particular haunts Big Nung for the rest of this episode. Yeah, one of the friends, like, asks if they even speak the same language. And I think this is also something that makes Big Nung stop because of the things that Little Nung has had to teach her. Because of 
her bridge to the younger generation. But like, remember when she had to learn what the word sapphic was and things like that. But if she was removed from this scenario and given a moment to think, she would realize that them having to teach each other stuff is part of the reason why their relationship is healthy because it keeps the communication going. It keeps them from being in a bubble in a way because like they both have ways to help each other grow. And that's that's the beauty. But like also like was not knowing the word sapphic detriment to their relationship. No. No, like <laughs> no, it never was. Like if you watch Big Nung and Little Nung, like we've been watching very intently, they don't even notice their age gap unless somebody else brings it up. Like they don't mm-hmm. notice it, which is evidence that it doesn't actually impact the two of them. Other people are impact are imposing things onto them, and so as this conversation is going, Juan Viva's Gator is on max alert because she steals a glance at Big Nung throughout the gossip section. I was like, oh dear. And I love when somebody is talking about Amp <laughs> and they're like, I'm worried about her. And as that line is on the screen, Wan Pim is looking at Big Nung because she's worried about Big Nung. And so I love the timing of that. Thank you, editors. Then, okay, then it keeps getting worse, this conversation. It's not like they're not bringing up valid points about some of this stuff. So the next point it's brought up about Amp's relationship is I'm afraid she will pass away first. <laughs> Why is that your concern? No, because like, uh, well, like that is, that's a, that's a thing that can happen. And so like, you can't convince me that Big Nung hasn't thought about that. Okay. She's thought about all the obstacles to their relationship, but she's been, She's been lost in the honeymoon phase of the relationship. To, and I think she's put a lot of these thoughts on the back burner. But you can't convince me she hasn't thought about that at all. Because, yeah, what happens if she goes? What happens? She's going to go first, presumably, you know. I mean, unless something happens. But, yeah. Right. That, it, it's, I mean, it's a pretty, it's a significant age gap where that is definitely a thing to be concerned about. Right. And, like, especially now, because the grandmam, like, just died, and right. the memory of song is replaying in her head currently. Like, this poor girl's having nightmares. I think. At least she's, like, waking up in the middle of the night. So, death is very much at the forefront of her mind, right. and there, it's just a lot going on. There's a lot of trauma around death, too, so. Yeah, but, like, that's, you know, that's a scary possibility, too, that, you know, they're they're off battling all these, like, family people, and it's like, oh, shit, yeah, there's also death to worry about. <laughs> so, Juan Viva can see how uncomfortable Big Nung is, because she's a big, she's a low-key, not a great one, but she's kind of a Big Nung whisperer a little bit, not as good as Little Nung, but she can kind of, like, read Big Nung, because they've known each other. And like a good friend, she sticks up for Big Nung without d- drawing attention to Big Nung. And I love the way she does this. And she says, I think love is about two people and age doesn't matter. And this scene is when I gained a lot of respect for Juan Viva because she's speaking to her friends in the AMP situation, but really she's speaking to Big Nung to calm her down in this scene. And I love her for doing that because Big Nung, like Little Nung, doesn't like being in the spotlight either. So she's not like putting a spotlight on Big Nung, but she's kind of like talking to her without talking to her, which I, I, I love her for that. Then Juan Viva follows us up by saying, it's none of our business. We are outsiders. We probably don't know all the details. Speak the facts, Juan Viva. Yeah, girl. I think this is definitely the best Juan Viva scene. Because mm-hmm. she is saying all the things that Big Nung needs to hear, like indirectly to her, but she's also letting Big Nung know that she accepts her at the same time, and that's the most important part. I love it. I love this scene actually. This scene is really cute, actually. It's a good scene with Juan Viva. Yeah. I agree. And to your last point, Caitlin, she's also shutting down the gossip at the same time, which I think is also important. Like, she's ending the bullshit yeah. while comforting Big Nung. And also, like, if you've seen any of Affair, Juan Viva had her own nightmare scenario with her love life. So, like, she's like, listen, outsiders will never understand. <laughs> like, that's just what it is. <laughs> like, just it's like, don't, 
you know? Oh my god, no, would they oh not understand god. her teenagehood either? Like, um, I still don't understand her teenage I don't, years. But <laughs> I, have to I don't think anyone does. So, yeah, like, you know, I, I, I in the context of that. Well, I mean, it was kind of speaking from experience, but I love how she handles this like a really good friend. And so Juan Viva's friends, after Juan Viva ends the gossip session by doing that, the friends change the subject and they're like, let's eat. I'm hungry. Yeah. And they don't even have the decency to respond to all the shit she just said. Like, she just called them out for, like, saying all these things and shut them down. Like, they could have said, you're right. I didn't think about that. My bad. But no, they're like, let's go eat. That'll make everything better. I mean, but they also didn't challenge her on it and be like, Juan, that's crazy. You know what I mean? They're just kind of like, I guess. Let's move on. It wasn't as big of a deal to them as it, as one people knew it was. Right. So as the friends are basically getting ready to get out of there, Juan Viva sees Big Nung is spiraling into a depression by her easel. So she tells the friends, how about you guys go ahead? I'll catch up. And Big Nung is so sad that she can barely muster a goodbye to her clients. Like the polite thing to do is to like say goodbye to them. She barely does that because she's like super triggered right now. So Juan Viva sits alone with Big Nung for a minute. She takes a seat on the table and she's watching Big Nung try to like put her mask back on. Because like she was feeling a bunch of feelings and like the mask was cracking and now she's like, crap, I still have an audience. So she's trying to put it back on and play, play it off cool like nothing bad happened. And it's failing miserably. So Juan Viva tells Big Nung, just forget about what they said. Because she knows you just got triggered by all this shit. But of course, Big Nung is Big Nung. So she tries to play dumb like she always does. And she's like, I don't know what you're talking about, Juan Viva. Internally, she's saying, this bitch. <laughs> this is Big Nung's card every single time. But Juan Viva's like, listen, that might work with anybody else, but I'm not anybody else. I'm your actual friend and I can read you. And I have to say, before we get further into this, when Juan Viva's sitting on the table, I do appreciate that behind Juan Viva is the Our Flag Means Death, like, rainbow ocean painting that used to be in Big Nung's, like, shabby little apartment in season one. So I like that they kept the prop and put it in the gallery because it's a really good painting. I do like that. Yeah. And it's super gay looking. So I love that it's there. Yeah. It's got a big rainbow on it. I love it. They're like, we have it. May as well put it in the art gallery. No, so I like that they kept it because they have new sets and new props and everything for season two. So I like that it made it there. Okay, so Juan Viva continues, and she's like, listen, I can read you, and I can see that you've changed. And also, Juan Viva has eyes, and she knows that Big Nung is clearly in love with Little Nung. And she's like, you're in love with Little Nung, right? Like, that's what this is about. And the second Juan <laughs> Viva says... Anyone with eyes. And the second Juan Viva says Little Nung's name, Big Nung's entire demeanor changes. And she goes from sad to panic, like straight up at panicking. But Juan Viva quickly reassures Big Nung, it's okay. Like, I'm happy for you. You finally found the one. And this is such a queer experience thing, what they're doing here, because it's one of those moments for Big Nun where she's bracing herself for a negative reaction to her relationship, but she gets a positive one instead. So I love that. It's always surprising. <laughs> I mean, coming off the cusp of the conversation that just happened, yes. like, also... Also, this is technically the first outsider to know about them like technically folk knows but like he is more of a brother to little nung right. at this point and this is the first step in acceptance for the public and big nung to realize that it could be okay if people know about them it was this was like if juan viva didn't accept it th things would have gotten worse right i agree and Part of this, too, is that as her friend, Juan Viva understands how monumental this is for Big Nung and why Big Nung having feelings for Little Nung is a miracle. And, like, what that truly means. Because Big Nung is the person who never had feelings for anybody and told people that. And I'm sure Juan Viva knew that. Like, they have a past. Like, she knows this about Big Nung. So to have Big Nung openly have feelings for another person is 
huge. So I think that that's the other thing where Juan Fief is like, I get how big this is. Like, regardless of what it looks like, like you found your happiness finally. Like that's huge, no matter who it is. And what I love in this conversation is that like a good friend, she doesn't push Big Nung on the topic. She just leaves Big Nung with her support and gives her the space to process and like leaves to go have lunch with the other friends. Like, because demonstrating that like Juan Viva does actually know Big Nung. It's not this, like, despite like Big Nung being Big Nung, like, and being the, being the person who's like, we hang out when I'm ready. Like Juan Viva does like clearly know Big Nung and it, she demonstrates it fully in this scene. Yes, she has brain cells with Big Nung. And yes. right before she leaves, she says, you're so obvious. And I love it. I love that she says that line. It's but beautiful. then I, I was just thinking, I'm like, okay, so you understand that what Big Nung is going through right now. I was like, can we go back to your teenagehood? And like, listen, I'm convinced in a fair Juan Viva knew what was going on. It was the other party. That was yeah, I think maybe time. she was Juan just Viva trying to like, time. I don't think she was confused. Wait for... Yes, she was waiting. She has the, the patience of a saint. Seriously, that's why she's no, friends with she... Big Nung. Yeah, <laughs> that's why she's no, what? She yeah, has that, a lot of patience. 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 That's her middle name. Juan Patience Viva. <laughs> no, <I don't> <laughs> that's how that works. Juan Viva Patience last name. All right. I also love the part in the scene where Juan Viva's like, "It's Little Nung, isn't it?" And Big Nung gives her that look, and she's like. She slams the desk. She's like, I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. Because <laughs> we've seen her putting the pieces together very slowly where she's like, this woman always looks I like she wants of... to fight me. <laughs> I feel like they were college friends. Like they they, they went to the same co- I forget which college she went to. But, um, I'm pretty sure it's the same one Little Nun went to. No, uh, Juan. I forget which one Juan went to. I mean, if they were college friends, they went to the same college. Yeah, I know, but I don't know no, if, if that was She went to College disparate. of Medicine because she's a doctor. I know that. Um, I'm not communicating correctly. But I feel like at that time in their life, that's when they were close. And, like, so she just knows her. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I was like going somewhere else with that. They probably met in college. Anyway, we still don't know. Okay. So that's the one of Eva's scene. So with that... We now transition to the age gap of it all because we had to highlight age gap's a problem. So this is the age gap is a problem episode. So let's get into this. So it's a brand new day. And on this day, Little Nong woke up and chose marathon running, which is apparently a hobby of hers. Like, good for her. But also odd we've never heard about this hobby up until now because usually people into marathon running make it their entire personality because it's a huge commitment to run 23 point whatever miles a day 23.5 <laughs> but uh, like seriously I, mean? I actually don't know i have no idea day. but like, I I just... <laughs> yeah 23.5 miles <laughs> no, <I don't> know. <laughs> 20 plus it's a lot but seriously where did this go <laughs> it's so random. i don't know <laughs> Yeah, it's, 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 it came out of nowhere. But uh, let us all appreciate the color coding. First of all, they're in athletic attire. Good job, ladies. I'm glad we didn't show up in Buffy the Vampire Slayer outfits to go <laughs> exercise. Where it's like, why are we in high heels? Like, okay, they dressed appropriately. I appreciate that detail because with women, it's not always on point. But let's talk how they're color coded. So we have Big Nung in all black except for the shoes that are white. So black cat. And then you have little Nung in like a golden retriever kind of outfit where she's in like a cream pinky kind of color top and like white shorts. So like golden retriever and the black cat go for a run. So first of all, I love that because that's who they are. But they're in contrasting colors if you look at them. So indicating to me that like they're not on the same page. They're not going to be on the same page in the scene. And it's primarily about their relationship. If you compare it and contrast it to the scene with Mon and Sam in the last episode where they were wearing, when they go to visit them and they were wearing complimentary colors because they were on the same page with the relationship here. It's a new day. We're not on the same page. Just based on the colors. Okay, so why are we here? Little Nung brought Big Nung with her today as an attempt to bond with her by doing something. Because like, what have we been doing most of the show? We've been drawing and reading which are big nung hobbies so now we're getting into little sharing little nung hobbies okay which is fair that's equality right but also like she's here to make her girlfriend healthier because love 
And to me, this is a super relatable scene because my wife and I do shit like this. And sometimes it does play out like this, depending on what the activity is that we're exercising in. <laughs> this, But this made me think of you talking about like those overnight hiking trips. Like how she... Had you go on one of those? No, I have no, okay. I have no desire to do that. It's you more just, like we'll yeah. do like we'll go to the gym or do like we do ab classes with our friends and like I always have to drag Julie. I like doing that stuff and I was like, we're doing ab classes. Julie's like, do we have to? Meanwhile, she'll she'll hike like twenty miles. So like, it it <laughs> depends. It, that's what I mean. It depends on the activity. So sometimes it does play out exactly like this. Like it's not like a lack of fitness thing. Like, it's like everyone has strength and weaknesses, even when it comes to athleticism. So, like, sometimes it just plays out like this. So it's, like, valid. Yeah. This is a valid scene. But the point is the age gap stuff. So Little Nung mentions running is a good way to relieve stress. And she thought, I think she thought Big Nung could benefit from that. <laughs> you know, Bene- fresh air Big and Nung's like, seems, seems stressed. Big, Big Nung's like, we could do other things to relieve stress. <laughs> I'm sure she thought that. But I, I wonder if, like, little, like, this seems like a random scene. But I wonder if, like, Little Nung noticed Big Nung shifted mood after the art gallery gossip incident. And I wonder if this is her way to, like, get Big Nung out of her head, give her a change of scenery. Like, I wonder if this was part of this was to help Big Nung in a way. But it, all Big Nung hears from that is Little Nung is stressed out. And so she asks, what are you stressed out about? Now I'm stressed. <laughs> it's like, damn it, Big Nung. And, and Little Nung is like, I'm not stressed. There's only one thing that stresses me out. And I wonder if she's referring to the family drama, because that seems to be the only thing that stresses her out and also seems to stress out Big Nung, which then stresses out Little Nung. Little Nung gets stressed out when Big Nung is stressed out. And like, so I'm like, I wonder what she actually meant when she's like, there's only one reason I get stressed. I wonder That's if it's relatable. Like, Big Nung. Because <laughs> Big Nung's response to that is, don't be stressed. I can deal with it. So I wonder if that they are referring to the family shit. Yeah, that seems plausible. Yeah. Regardless, Little Nung suggests they race because this is supposed to be fun, right? And Big Nung, of course, is grumpy about this because she's not an exercise enthusiast. And also, it's really hard to jump into exercising, especially marathon running, when you don't do it often. Who jumps right into marathon running? (laughs) People who want to get injured. Like, you got to build yourself up to that. That's, you don't, you cannot just jump into that without hurting yourself. I don't care how old you are. Okay, so about one lap into this, Big Nung needs a break, which is relatable. (laughs) Get the most relatable. And I'm just glad that they didn't make Big Nung immediately good at running too, because then she would just be weirdly perfect, and we can only handle so much Big Nung energy. I agree. I mean, she's relatable, so that's a form of perfection, so I'll take that. Yeah. (laughs) But but of course, Big Nong can't keep up. So Little Nong takes the opportunity to tease Big Nong about her age. She's like, it's because you're old, right? That's why you can't keep up with me. Which makes Big Nong even more insecure than she was a minute ago. And then... This is... uh, Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Like, the, the age thing you don't understand um this is what it felt like trying to explain to the kids i babysit why my knee was hurting and giving out randomly i'm like your your kids you won't understand (laughs) yeah so big nung starts dropping facts where she's like you're not 30 yet you don't understand when you start getting back aches and shit like that and it's like also like Yes, that is all valid, but also, like, she doesn't run regularly. So, like, this is going to be hard. She has to start somewhere. Even if she, not to say that 30-year-olds can't run or get into marathon running. You definitely can. I know people that have done it. You have to warm up and practice, like. And it's going to be harder for her because she's a 30-year-old who doesn't do this. And, like, you're a 20-something-year-old who's like, I'm going to wake up and run a marathon. And it's like, what? (laughs) Girl, what? But yeah, exactly. This is just a fact. So regardless, this keeps going and they are just not on the same page in this conversation because Little Nung 
is joking. Like, she's just joking because this is supposed to be fun, right? But Big Nung is taking all of this way too seriously because she's in her head right now because of the Juan Viva friend conversation. And so everything's going to trigger her because she's going to overthink literally everything that happens until she's untriggered. So the way I kind of like read this a little bit is that like Big Nung in the scene feels insecure because she feels like the quote weaker one because she's failing at the physical running test and she's defensive about it because this is a quote a flaw, Miss per Perfect, right? So she still gets triggered by all the perfection stuff. I feel like that haunts her forever. And like, again, Juan Viva's friends are in her head being like, you're going to die for us, Nung, and like all this shit, you know what I mean? She's just insecure right now. Particularly about their age gap shit. Meanwhile, it's like playing out in front of her. Also, little Nung has none of these thoughts. There's no thoughts in her head right now. She's just happily teasing her girlfriend and having fun. And it's just like... To me, like, the beauty of this scene is that it's a metaphor for their relationship stripped of the stigma and the outside forces. It's just, it is demonstrating that they are different. Running doesn't have to be a bad thing, Big Nun. No, but getting teased by your girlfriend for being old. No, that that's, sucks. That's what's triggering her right now. Okay, so I'm going to go break down this scene, the running scene, and show why I think it's a metaphor for their relationship. Okay, so here's some translations for how this is going to go. So running, every time they're running, so running equals the journey of life. Okay, so that's the metaphor for the journey of life. Their athletic differences is a metaphor for the age gap, which is more obvious. And then the race that they're doing, because remember, Lin Long's like, let's race, is a metaphor or stand in for like milestones. So things like in life. So like graduating, getting a job, traveling, marriage, all that kind of stuff. So keep that in mind. So let's break down the scene. So in the scene, they race together and Little Nung pulls away from Big Nung because of their athletic differences or the age gap. So once they start trying to achieve shit in life, like they're going to separate because they're at different starting points because of their, quote, athletic differences, which is the age gap. So once that starts happening, there's a visible division between the two of them. The age gap becomes noticeable and their athletic difference, because of the athletic differences, right? And during the race in the scene, Little Nung looks back and notices that distance between them. But instead of going forward to win the race or achieve those milestones, Little Nung turns back and returns to Big Nung with the intention of moving forward to complete the race together or like doing the journey of life together, right? Because Little Nung doesn't want to complete the milestones if she doesn't have Big Nung. Like the journey of life means nothing if Big Nung is not with her. Hence why she doesn't finish the race and win like she could have. She goes back and gets Big Nung. So what I also love about this is that something Big Nung has expressed over and over again is her concern about holding Little Nung back, which is the subtext of this scene, okay? It's overtly about the age gap, but it's about the subtext of Big Nung holding Little Nung back, okay? Because she's in a different place in her life because of her 30-year-old body, quote, in the race, right? So what's Big Nung's solution to, like, the gap? to let go of Little Nung so she can win the race without her. So she says in the scene, next time, find somebody else to run with you. I won't come anymore. Meaning like, maybe you should go on this journey with somebody your own age, somebody who's at your level. If you go with me, I'm just going to hold you back. But if you look at Little Nung in the scene, when Big Nung's saying this, Little Nung's just smiling, just like, get out of here. Because... She, little Nung's not here to win a race, okay? She wants to experience the run or the journey of life with Big Nung. That's what she really wants. It's not about the milestones. It's about going through all the things with Big Nung. That's what makes her happy. That's why she's smiling. I think that is the moral of this whole show. Like, it does seem like on the outside that she could or people think that little nung could do more in life without being with big nung because this age gap is so big but she doesn't care about anything like that limits her because with big nung she doesn't feel like there are any limits because all she needs is her like she, big nung really isn't holding her back she can still do everything that she's going to 
like the only difference would be either well first not being happy and like what dating someone her own age and who's like no it makes no difference basically just be together guys we love you i mean i again like from i mean but let's go back and like look at this from big nung's point of view like in the race little nung's pulling ahead of her and is smiling and doing fine and big nung is on the struggle bus and then little nung has to come back and get her and and in big nung's point of view she's like i just robbed you of winning slash achieving something in life because you had to slow down for me so I'm holding you back. Like, that's her point of view. And that's not wrong. Like, it's valid to feel like that. Like, I understand where she's coming from. But I also understand where Little Nung's coming from. Again, they're not on the same page. And that's the mm-hmm. whole point. Because then Little Nung says to Big Nung, after she's like, hey, run with somebody else next time. Meaning, like, you should leave, you should let me go so you can succeed. Little Nung says, I don't want to run with anybody else. And she hugs Big Nung. They're in public. Remember this. And what's important about this line is that up till now, Little Nung has been teasing Big Nung and just laughing and not taking this seriously. And when she says, I don't want to run with anybody else, that's when Little Nung gets serious. Because what Little Nung is saying is that she's 100% certain in the metaphor that she wants to experience her life with Big Nung no matter what that means. She's not joking about that. Like, she picks up now that like, okay, you were being serious about this. You don't like these age gap jokes that I was just doing. And I promise I won't do that anymore. Like, because I think Little Long feels like, oh, I just triggered you and I didn't mean to, because to me it doesn't matter. But to you, it seems to still matter or bother you. I won't do that anymore. Okay, because Little Long is saying to me, it doesn't matter. It's all that matters is you. So then Little Long brings up the solution for how they win the race, okay? How they achieve all the things. And she says, basically, she says, like, hey, because Big Nung brings up the age gap. She's like, and Little Nung's like, well, even though we're of different ages, like, we still feel the same. Our hearts are the same. So, like, that's all that matters. And what Little Nung is doing is she's reassuring Big Nung that this perceived difference doesn't define their relationship. We've said it before. When they're alone, they don't notice the age gap. It's only when other people bring attention to it that Big Nung gets in her head, right? And what this is really showing and what's beautiful about this is it shows that there are many aspects to a relationship and theirs works because of the way they treat each other and they communicate and the other things they have in common. Like the differences don't necessarily divide them. Like you were saying, Caitlin, if anything, it makes them stronger because like Big Nung offers, I'm going to use this term lightly, wisdom (laughs) to the relationship. (laughs) Wisdom in a way, because like she has some life, she has life experience, right? So she could help Little Nung with like financial stuff. I mean, who knows, like, what she really knows. But, like, she can I, help little... Know fin- yeah. I know, that's what I mean. I, I don't know that she really can. But she could offer her some, like, I've been through this, don't make this mistake, and, like, guide her a little bit. Whereas Little Nun could be like, hey, like, I know all these new things that you're not privy to because of who you hang out with, like, learning new terms and, th- you know, things like that. So Big they balance Nung each other out. doing that with, like, the grandmother and all the family relationship because she knows her experience. Yeah, no, literally, like, that's how Big Nung is actually bringing her experience. But you're like, "Mm, I know where this is headed with your grandmother. Let's not do that. Right. Remember the scene where she's like, I uniquely understand you and your grandmother. Let me help you with this. And, like, Little Nung is like, I understand you're freaking out. and There's no need to freak out. Like, anyway. So that's how I think this is all one big metaphor for their relationship. And so how does this conclude? Little Nung promises not to take Big Nung running anymore. Okay. AKA, what she's really saying here is like, hey, it's okay if we have different hobbies and interests. Like, that's fine. We don't have to like be on the same page about literally every aspect of our lives. That's weird and doesn't always make a healthy relationship either. But then she says, but after seeing you run today, I am concerned about your health. So you're going to come to yoga with me instead. (laughs) Which which I love. She's like, you need to do some kind of exercising. I'm getting you a (laughs) drink. Oh, they're adorable. Oh my God. I love that. And what I do love in this scene too is that they're outside, they're in public. Little Nung hugs her. Big Nung lets Little Nung cling to her. So she's like, that's a little bit of progress, right? That is progress. 
I also love that Big Nung is like, let's stick to drawing. Because Big Nung doesn't sport. I mean, no, she just did that. <laughs> and that's fine. And that's fine. She's not a sport. She's not a sporty lesbian. Then that's fine. We're okay with that. But anyway, love that scene. Good metaphor. Well done, everyone. All right. So let's jump over to the emotional support lesbians because they're watching a movie at home doing their little cute date night. And Mon is super into this movie and is just having a gay old time. And she's trying to feed Sam like this fancy popcorn. But Sam is like not even watching the movie. She's just zoned out 100%. And it seems to me like this is how they normally watch movies, which begs the question, how many limes would you need to counteract the sweetness of Mon and Sam watching a movie? <laughs> they're just watching a movie doing this. this. <laughs> I need at least five because they're ridiculous. Oh my but God. I love how she could just feed her without even looking. I know. That's what I mean. <laughs> like they must keep, they must do this over and over again. This is just how they watch movies. It's just natural. Anyway, so funny. So Ma notices the popcorn is not going into Sam's mouth because Sam is spaced <laughs> out. And so she's like, she's like oh. yeah, she's like, to her mouth. <laughs> oh, okay. So Ma puts the popcorn away, turns off the movie. And that's when Sam kind of snaps out of it. She's like, oh, what's going on? And she's like, listen, Sam, would you rather talk than watch the movie? Because you're not, you're, you're not here right now. And Sam apologizes because she knew Mon was super excited. This Mon's movie night. So Mon picked the movie. She was really, obviously, Mon was really excited about this movie. And Sam's like, oh, I'm ruining it because I'm like mentally not here right now. And so Sam's like, no, I feel bad. You want to watch it. But, which is true. But Mon was like, like, your well-being is more important than a movie. So Mon's like, it's fine, Sam. We live together. We can watch this another time. Which, okay, I like the scene with the two of them because, like, they're communicating about their feelings. Good job, guys. They've come a long way. <laughs> they have. Oh, my gosh. This is polar opposite from Gap. Usually Sam just fires half the company when <laughs> they don't talk. Well, Sam would have just, like, left. I don't even know how this would have gone down. Anyway, so, like, they're communicating. Good for them. So Sam gets into it. Ultimately, she's worried about Nung's complicated relationship. And she's coming up. And being Sam, she's like, I want to help her, but I don't know how. Because Sam is the family glue and would do anything for her family. But right now, she feels really helpless and lost for how to help Nung. And also to add to that, like, Nung is clearly not okay. Like, Nung keeps coming over and it looks upset and just worried. And Sam's like, that's making me worried. I don't know how to help you. And I hate seeing you like this. Yeah, Sam is really good at taking on the problems that her loved ones have. Yes. Like, she had to be the one to work hard to keep her family together. And boy, did she work hard so for that. So hard. To and her own detriment. I, yes. And I feel so bad that she never got to have her family back together really but it means that she was basically trying to keep everyone happy which is exhausting since there is no easy fix to big nung's problem right now it's stressing sam out more because now someone she loves is sad and having a hard time but she can't make it go away there's literally nothing that she could do yeah, so like i think she's also spiraling <laughs> Yeah, Sam is a people pleaser. She's a huge people pleaser. And the thing is, like, Sam, everything that Sam is doing by being there for Nung when Nung needs her is, like, it's all she can do. So, like, she is doing stuff, but she's like, how do I, I how do I do more so it's fixed? And it's like, right. So Mon kindly reminds Sam that she's like, look, Sam. Remember Gap? You have amnesia for some reason about us. But, like, remember, <laughs> we we overcame impossible obstacles with our relationship. And, look, things worked out. We're having cute movie nights and all this kind of stuff. So she assures Sam that, like, hey, you're being, like, you can be a supportive sister, but, like, not to stress out too much about this. Because, like, Nung has to fight this battle, you know. Mon takes it upon herself to fully distract Sam by turning on the charm. She's like, well... Since we aren't going to watch a movie, I could entertain you instead. And so, this is the classic Mon and Sam. So Sam's like, uh, entertain me how? Because Sam's into this. And Mon, Mon softly caresses Sam's back and gives her best bedroom eyes and then suggests they go out to eat. 
in their pajamas. <laughs> and Sam thankfully has a brain cell somehow. And she's like, how about we eat in and don't go anywhere? So, and I love how they keep using cooking and eating as a metaphor for sex, which is really funny. And they do it the whole scene. And so Mon's like, yeah, okay, I could be into that. So Sam dives headfirst into Mon's personal space, which is super, like, again, it's, what is this? The insane lesbian focus that these sisters have where they're just like, yes. And then Mon <laughs> escapes and gets up, leaving Sam rightfully confused. She's like, what the fuck, Mon? And Mon's like, how about we go cook in the bedroom, Sam? Not on this couch. <laughs> Follow me upstairs. And like 10 out of 10 lines for this scene because this is classic Mon. This is what is lovable about Mon and Sam. Like, the scene. I love how well she pulled that off. And like, right? part of me thinks that Sam literally meant they should cook in. <laughs> like, I, I don't mean, know if she fully understood the thing at first. <laughs> uh, yeah, Sam is pretty literal. <laughs> Yeah. But then she got it. She's like, oh, eat you. Got it. And then she dove in and Mon's like, not on the couch, Sam. Let's go. That's upstairs. my favorite meal. <laughs> All right. So after the limes, we go visit Little Nung at university. And she's walking with folk, minding her own business, when a couple of fan humans approach. And they out her as the voice of the infamous podcast. Somehow this thing has taken off so much. You know, what is your secret? Let us know. So they're like, oh, you made the podcast, right? We're your fans. And at, for, like, at first it's respectful, right? They're telling Little Nung, hey, we just enjoy enjoy your voice. We love your work. But then like any fandom, shit gets toxic immediately when they start gushing over how much cuter she is in real life and stuff. And she's like, oh, dear. Oh, dear. Big Nung definitely would not be happy right now if she was here. She'd be like, what do you mean my girlfriend's cute? <laughs> right, no. She would out them, their relationship, immediately. Yeah, and be like, don't touch my girlfriend, fuck you. And, but unfortunately, Big Nung's not there. And poor little Nung is living her worst nightmare because her knight in shining armor, Big Nung, is not with her. Because like you said, it'd go down differently, or not at all, if intimidating tiger Big Nung was there, you know? But you know who is here? Folk. And Yui, who eventually sees this and also comes to the rescue. And together, her friends extract Little Nung from the situation she is clearly uncomfortable in. And I'm glad Little Nung finally has a supportive friend group who's willing to step in and help her when she's overwhelmed. Like, you saw her freezing up. Because at first, the, the fans are like, hey, can I get a picture with you? And Little Nung's like, yeah, yeah. She just looks like a deer in headlights, you know? Like, she doesn't know what to do. So I like that she has friends who are just like, or like, no, 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 leave her alone and like, get her out of there. because She does not want to be there. Yui is her stand-in knight in shining queer armor. Side note, I love that Yui's shirt isn't tucked in. And I was thinking about it and it makes Yui look more free. And because Yui is proud and able to be herself in public whereas little nung wants to conform and not draw attention to herself because she doesn't want to be the center of attention and she's also not allowed to be herself right now like there is a part of her she's hiding so to me like the shirt being tucked in means little nung's doing what's expected of her where yui's just like i'm free i can do what i want yeah that's a good that's a good read i mean yui never talks tucks the shirt in so yeah it's a way of not conforming where yui doesn't conform to like the norms so i, I like that i think that tracks all right so but the problem is that yui and folk aren't the best bodyguards because they literally take little long five feet away from the fan humans before stopping to talk to her but also, like, if you look in the frame, there's another pair of fan humans taking photos or videos of Little Nung in the background. Like, they didn't do a great job of actually extracting her from this situation. Like, guys, next time, take her out of the building. Like, safety first. Like, what was this? They didn't have bodyguard training. They didn't expect to have to be bodyguards. <laughs> no, but I know. But, like, you could... Actually, they've been her bodyguards for a while. Like, yeah. remember they had a conversation about it? Well, at least Yui is a bodyguard. But, like, come on, guys. There's other fans. Like, get her out of there. Anyway, Little Nung is perplexed because she doesn't understand how anybody found out she was the voice of the podcast. Uh, it's like Yui warned earlier, determined people will find everything about you on the internet. Just ask Caitlin. <laughs> what, like it's hard? 
creepy as fuck. (laughs) It's not hard. It's so easy. It's right there. (laughs) As long as you use it for non-nefarious purposes. Okay, but this was nefarious. It was outing somebody who didn't want to be outed. Yeah. But little on comments that she's like, people have been staring at me weird all day and I've felt uncomfortable at school all day and I didn't know why until now. And it's like, this is really disheartening to hear because university seems like it was becoming a safe space for little Nong. And now it's been destroyed by toxic fandom behavior. So let us all take in the lesson the writers are trying to address about toxic fandom behavior and how yes. the voice behind the beautiful piece of art is a human being with feelings. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let yes. that soak in. That's what they're trying to say. Did it soak in yet? Did it soak in yet? We need to respect, respect, respect the artists. Respect the artists. Artists are people. Okay. After a quick Google search, Folk finds out that Little Long's fandom posted some problematic fan art. Problematic as in it's a complete invasion of her privacy. And uh, it's a photo of Little Nung. Yeah, like, yay, I'm the I'm the master behind this podcast. And Little Nung hates the spotlight and literally started an audio-only podcast so she can get the feel for her DJ life with, while remaining anonymous. And this was working for her, but now everybody, everything she built is crumbling around her, which, like... This was going so well, and now it's like everything's destroyed in like one fell swoop because of like toxic fan behavior. And I have to give a moment of appreciation to the blank intern that made the fan art because Yoko in the the screenshot is wearing a blank The Serious t-shirt, which I love. (laughs) So you gotta love their commitment to the product placement in this particular episode. It's like super on point. That's a blank t-shirt from their promo stuff. So love that. They are so committed to branding the show in the show. It's uh, Yeah, no, I love, I'm here for it. I'm here for it. Okay, but this is also a really weird photo of her I to agree. be online if she <laughs> isn't agree. a public personality. Like, how did they even get this? What was like, this I understand what they were doing. trying to do. But, like, why was she doing there's this There's no way naturally. that this photo exists. Right. Like, what was the scenario where Little Nug was doing this particular, like, yay pose? Because Little Nug hates... Why yeah, was, where no. did this come from? Where's the OG? This photo I'm just does curious. not exist. <laughs> All right. I'm just curious, knowing Little Nug, why does this photo even exist? It, that's this what I'm is saying. not Little Nug. This is her evil twin sister. Was this AI? <laughs> did they AI this? <laughs> oh, it's possible. God. It anyway. Is. Little Nong is upset and confused why people want to know who she is so badly that they went through these links. And Yuri responds that it's because her voice is beautiful. And like, okay, I understand what Yuri's getting at, but this exchange gives me, quote, pretty girl trope vibes. Where like, beauty is a curse. And the price for beauty is unwanted attention. And quote, pretty girls are expected to just deal with that as part of being pretty. Which is complete bullshit. The pretty girl is little known in this scenario. And the pretty girl is not at fault for other people's bad behavior because she's pretty. Like, that's on them for being creepy as fuck. You know what I mean? That's like the school dress code when you can't, like, wear spaghetti straps because it will distract other people. Like, why are you even looking at your... It makes right. no sense. Right. That's what this exchange gave me. It's like, well, little if you weren't so pretty, this wouldn't be happening. It's like... Again, you're victim blaming. This is victim blaming. Pretty girl is victim blaming. You're like, it's on her for attracting, making boys lose control. It's on you for for making your fans lose control. Like, no, it's on them for invading her privacy and outing her and being creepy. Okay. And then Little Nung, who has. Huh? Which is unfortunate. Which is unfortunately a common thing in fandoms. Yeah. Mm hmm. The entitlement stuff. Right. That's. That's. It's what the writers are trying to talk about in the show, <laughs> but not actually talking about it. And Little Nung, who has the brain cell in every, she- in every scene, unless Brig Nung snatches it away with her big gay energy, gives Yui this look at the end where she seems disappointed with the answer, which like, yeah, this is a bullshit answer to blame her for having a pretty voice. 
because this kind of excuse in real life just excuses toxic. It's excusing the toxic fandom behavior. And also, like, I feel like Little Nung seems a little disappointed in Yui because Yui was the one handling the social media stuff and assured her she had a handle on this. Not that Yui's the blame at all. I don't think that's mm-hmm. the, that's not the case. I think Little Nung in the scene is upset that this is happening and is having a lot of feelings. It was like, Yui, you were watching social media. Like, how did this, like, because they seem all seem very blindsided by this. So it's weird that, like, nobody yeah, found how out did, she was outed. You know what I mean? If they're monitoring little it. Little have known before yeah it's really yeah, weird i don't i don't think little Nung monitors her own social media i think yui was the one doing it so i think there's a level of like how did you not warn me you know what i mean and she's having a lot of feelings right now and like yui was the social media manager that's all i'm saying not that she's the blame then folk chimes in with more helpful words than what yui was saying and tells little Nung, listen it, what happened happened but you have us and we're here to help you because like we're your ride or die so no matter what we got your back and we'll get you through this and at this, having support, like, Little Long perks up. Because finally she has people that love her and are willing to, like, fight battles together with her instead of abandoning her immediately. I love this smile so much at the end because you can tell she feels supported. And it's so nice to see Little Nung secure now than the trauma in the beginning of the show. Like, I love, I mean, it's, it's a basic thing but she didn't have it and now she does and i really yeah. like it i know she's she has also come a long way in a lot of aspects of her life which is really beautiful so after the camaraderie the trio exits the building where knight in shining armor big nung is waiting as always gotta be the first person little nung sees when she gets out of school and little nung approaches like a sad puppy and big nung goes from yay to what the fuck happened who do i have to murder like immediately she's, worried. <laughs> she's like what happened what the fuck happened but there's like about five or so seconds of like weird silence in between like no one speaks when they come out but don't worry there is a bird there to fill the silence yeah the asian coal followed big nung to this scene and i'm sorry if you didn't notice that before but here we are. It shows up. Because <laughs> Big Nung Cinderella. So after little Big Nung starts looking worried, Yui tells Big Nung what happened. And Big Nung looks behind Little Nung and notices a bunch of fan humans with their phones all out taking photos. And Big Nung knows that, that attention makes Little Nung super uncomfortable. So she immediately rolls with whatever is happening and lets Little Nung drag her into the car. Because Little Nung's like, I'll tell you later. We got to get out of here. So she's like, okay. But before that could happen, Big Nung tells you and folk, get home safely. And I think that's Big Nung code for thank you. Yeah. I was, like, really surprised at first that she told them to. Because, like, usually she just kind of, like, ignores the other people in the room when Little Nung's around. No. Well, with them, she's always like, make sure Little Nung's safe. And they're yeah. like, yes, ma'am. And here she's like, you guys be safe. So that's a thank you. That's about their yeah. well-being, not Little Nung's well-being. You did well. Thank you. That's what she was saying. Also, behind her, those people are definitely taking photos of, like, them holding hands. Yep. (laughs) And, like, I'm surprised drama didn't come out of this. Like, I'm surprised they did not use this at all. Like, I agree. (laughs) How is... How... Okay, so, like, Little Nung has a toxic fandom already. You don't think wherever these bitches are hanging out, their Discord server, whatever they're chatting in you don't think there's photos of people being jealous of big nung because like okay to the average person they're like oh maybe that's her auntie or whatever or like they wouldn't think anything of it because of the age gap but a toxic fandom reads into everything it would be like no mm-hmm. no did you see the way she was looking at her look at the- they would be putting a timeline together and be like wait a minute i saw her she comes picks her up every day and they're always smiling at each other you know that that they were immediately would be a conspiracy about those two dating immediately oh, yeah. from a toxic fandom. Like, there's no way that doesn't happen. Definitely. Definitely. Like, now there's photos of, like, Luna holding her hand. Like, there's no way. Anyway, that 100% happened in the fandom. But I guess, like, the fandom is not credible, so it never makes it to the news. <laughs> okay. But also they'd be like, oh, well, oh, well here's probably what happened because of the laws. They're like, wait, isn't that an ML? <laughs> Like, we can't run the story without confirmation because laws. But the yeah. fandom can gossip all they want because it's a fandom. Anyway. 
There's no way those rumors weren't flying on the internet. They definitely They were. had to be. They had to be. Also, these two are not subtle in public. <laughs> That's what I mean. Like, I think the, now that they know who Little Nug is, people who have, like, maybe peripherally noticed her have been like, yeah, you know, you know. Immediately there could be conspiracy theories. Anyway, so while that, so while a new fan fandom is happening or fandom behavior is happening about Big Nung and Little Nung, because it's definitely happening on the internet, Knight in shining armor, Big Nung whisks Little Nung away from the university. And during the drive, Little Nung laments over being outed as the podcast host because she purposely did not reveal her identity or show her face in associating with him with the podcast and is truly baffled why so many people cared enough about her identity to internet stalk her and then stalk her in real life. But if you're on the internet in any public capacity, you need to be prepared for people to find you. Cause like, it's always a possibility. And I'm, it's like more surprising that they haven't caught her with big none yet. Like we just said, like, I mean, literally, I'm surprised the fandom doesn't out them, didn't out them, and that was how this I, got out. Like, truly, I was really expecting that to happen. That makes more sense than he- than Chet figuring it out because he's an idiot. The fans are way more smart. They figured this out. Like, there's no way they don't figure this out. Like that they're dating. They definitely would have figured this out. Yeah, definitely. No, you know? like Chet Chet fi- figuring it out is like not plausible. Like, how did the fandom in the next episode not catch? Big Don kissing Little Nung's cheek outside the school. Like, you don't think there's fandom there's so photos much of that? Going on you know what I after mean? This. You know what I mean? There's no way they didn't figure that out. Anyway. So Big Nung reasons that her fans probably like and admire her so much that they just went through all this trouble to figure out who she was. And to me, Little Nung seems over this because now her university life just became 10 times more complicated than it was a minute ago. She's just supposed to go to school, do well, see Big Nung. Now it's like, go to school, dodge stalkers, like, not be un- be uncomfortable. Like, what the fuck? And so she kind of just keeps, like, expressing her frustration. And Big Nung is listening. And to me, in the car, like, Big Nung doesn't read as bothered or jealous like when she's talking to big little nung in this conversation it's more like she's simply stating facts about little nung because she likes and admires little nung's bravery to like put herself out there through the podcast which is something big nung would never do unless under extreme circumstances like we see later in the series i could see them doing a podcast together though like, Little Nung would be dragging Big Nung into it, but then Big Nung would have so much fun. It would literally be what Fai and Yoko do when they're vlogging. Like, it would literally be that. Where it's always Yoko in- instigating shit. And then <laughs> I trying to be all cool and shit, and then it cracks in, like, five seconds. And they just end up giggling and having fun. Like, that's literally what their podcast would be. Yeah. Yeah. And we should be, it's, what, their dynamic is entertaining. It would be entertaining to be have Big Nung be like, I don't want to do this. And then, like, end up like getting into it at the end because she's having fun. All right, so Big Nung explains to Little Nung that it doesn't take a functioning brain cell to figure out why all these people are obsessed with her. She's like, you're, you're hot and your voice is beautiful. I don't, under- I don't understand. And like, I love that Big Nung is trying to chide her. She's like, wait a minute. So your problems boil down to like, you're beautiful, your voice is beautiful. Like cue the world's tiniest violin. What a problem to have. Like she's kind of like teasing her back. Because Little Nung's always teasing Big Nung. She's like, you're so beautiful and blah, blah, blah. And that's your problem. And like, come on now. And so she gets to like, do it back and be like, really? That's your problem. But all Little Nung hears is, wow, she thinks I'm pretty. Because <laughs> <laughs> of course that's that would be her takeaway. <laughs> that's the takeaway. She's like, wow, Big Nung thinks I'm pretty. All right. After all the flattery, then Big Nung's insecurities come out. Where she says, those people probably, you know, in, in all realism, are trying to take pictures with you because... Like, do you think it's, they're just fans or they're like, they want to date you? Like, what do you think this really is? Cause like, this is extreme behavior to be, to be fair. And that's when Little Nung looks over the, the Big Nung and gives her this tremendous side eye. Because how could Big Nung even think this? Little Nung has told her repeatedly from day one, that Big Nung is the most important person in her life and her feelings for Big Nung never change. And she's appalled that Big Nung would even joke about that. And Big Nung's like, wait, well, no, no. She's like, listen, listen, I'm not trying to be funny with you. I, I'm just, 
I'm curious. Because again, like to me, Big Name doesn't read as like jealous or anything. She's just like, no, I'm just, what do you think this is happening? Like, because like after all, to anyone that isn't them or Mon or Sam or I guess Juan Viva now, Little Nung is a single attractive woman. And she's comes from a wealthy family. So like she's a catch. And suddenly Ling Nung has all these new admirers her age that are into the same things as she is. Hence why they were listening to this podcast in the first place. And we're coming back to the racing metaphor. Okay, coming into fruition. Remember when Big Nung's like, maybe you should let me go and be with somebody your own age, metaphorically through all this running talk. Well, here's that scenario. Big Nung's starting to think now. She's like, oh, well, shit. Well, I, okay, I don't like actually being in this position where I could actually lose you to one of these admirers. And deep down, Big Nung doesn't want to let Little Nung go. Like, selfishly, she doesn't want to let her go. She doesn't want to lose her. And she's like, crap, now you have all these, like, people. Like, I, 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 do I need to be threatened? Like, the way my, quote, admirers are threatening to you? So that's what's going on with Big Dunks. And now we transition into the give a mouse a cookie negotiation for how to make this situation less complicated. Because this is getting complicated, right? It's, you know, now Big Nung's got a little violin playing. So before Big Nung can overthink this, Little Nung derails her thoughts by suggesting, how about I just fake date, date folk? That'll make the situation less complicated. Because publicly, I'll be dating somebody and they've seen me with folk. It won't be a shock. And Big Nong's face, when she suggests this, says, I hate this idea with a passion. <laughs> because Big Nong says, she's like, you absolutely cannot do this. Because it would make things more complicated. But complicated for who, Big Nong? Who's, who's going to be more complicated for? This is, She's like, what the hell are you thinking? But I am sure at this point... Little Nung has read countless fake dating books and has read at least one to Big Nung. Oh, yes. I know it's different because Folk is a dude, but Big Nung isn't taking any chances. <laughs> what if they actually fall in love? Okay, okay, there's that. There's that hilarity that would never happen. But also, yes, Big Nung is like, how dare you date anybody that isn't me? That's number one reaction. But number two, the more logical thing she's actually worried about in this scenario is that like, okay, if you suddenly start fake dating folk and then we tell your family that you are fake dating folk, that erases all of the um, headroom I'm trying to make with getting them to accept your queerness. Because if you just start dating a man, they're going to forget about the queerness. And then how can we bri make a bridge so that we can be together? Because like Big Nung in the background is trying to build that bridge to be like, except she's queer, except she wants to date a woman one day, except that. So if folk comes into the picture, all of that comes crumbling down. And like, and I, so in a way she's right. It will make things more complicated because then like, it's going to be even more shocking that they're dating. And they'll be like, what do you mean? You were dating a man. Go back to that. You're not queer. You know what I mean? Yeah. That would happen. Unfortunately. Yeah, so, and I think that Little Nung reads the subtext of Big Nung's possessiveness in this moment, because she is, because the first reaction is, how dare you date someone that isn't me? Because Little Nung's next suggestion is designed to get the cookie she's been after since the 202 dream scene, okay? So Little Nung says, well, how about I just tell the entire world my girlfriend... I have a girlfriend and that way no one will try and date me, including stupid men. And then stupid men like my useless father won't try to date you either. How about we okay, just do that? But like, have you met men? They're still going to try. This is little one trying to get a cookie and not actually solve that problem. But yes, so translation, what she's actually saying is, can I tell the world you're my girlfriend? That's what she's saying. Because this is how little Nung labels Big Nung girlfriend in her brain and let us all recall the scene in 202 when little nung asked big nung are we girlfriends now remember the morning after scene she's like are we girlfriends now and big nung at that time was like unable to label it so this is little nung trying again where she's suggesting to big nung how about we just tell people we're girlfriends like the label and what does big nung do she says no and immediately little nung's like fuck but then big nung continues and she goes It'll be even worse if we did that. You shouldn't do anything. Which, which would, it's just Big Nung talk for, don't tell people I'm your girlfriend, that's gonna make this more complicated. So Little Nung gets her cookie of Big Nung admitting 
She thinks of me as her girlfriend. Perfect. I win. <laughs> She's like, that. that's all I need. But, like, again, this is a scene of, like, them not talking about it, but talking about it. And so, like, they never have the are we girlfriends conversation ever again, but here it is. <laughs> Big little one got her I'm, cookie. Yep, that's all the confirmation she needs. But I feel like she would still want to tell everybody that she's her girlfriend. Well, well Lignan like, just gave her permission to be like, yeah. I, I can call you my girlfriend and I can, you are, you think of me as your girlfriend. That's all I needed to know. That's fine. And Little Nung, who finally got her cookie, is so happy because, again, this proves that Big Nung labels Little Nung as her girlfriend in her brain, even though she's never directly asked Little Nung to be her girlfriend, nor has she ever used the girlfriend label out loud. So it's enough for Little Nung to know that's how Big Nung sees her. Because Big Nung, again, is never going to offer that. So hydrate for Little Nung because she played Big Nung perfectly and finally secured her girlfriend status. So good for you. You got the ultimate cookie in the scene. Great job, Little Nung. She got a cookie cake. (laughs) So they are officially girlfriends as of this episode. All right. And she can't stop smiling. And then there's this brief moment where they look at each other and no words are spoken. And Little Nung has to like... Because she's smiling. She's like, yeah, she just admitted it. And I don't think Big Nung is so worried about the Little Nung dating anybody else scenario. She doesn't realize what she just said. So she looks at Little Nung and Little Nung's like, no, I'm being, I'm just, I'm being real serious right now. This is no laughing. I'm being serious. And then Big Nung's <laughs> like, good, you better be serious. No words are exchanged. This is all with their eyes. And then she goes back to driving and then Little Nung is like, oh my God, she thinks I'm her girlfriend. Like, she just starts smiling at <laughs> She's like, she <laughs> thinks I'm her girlfriend. Anyway, it's hilarious. So... <laughs> I love the two of them. Because, yeah, Big Nung has no idea what she just confessed to. And so I just love that Little Nung's like, I'm just going to keep quiet. Because, you know, just silently celebrate in the car. <laughs> uh, so I love that. Scene. So I love just how, like, why are you happy? Because, like, Little Nung has done this before. This was the same move in, what was it, 204, where they're in the hallway. And she's like, gets, her, gets Big Nung to admit she likes her by being like, She's like, you must hate me. And she's like, I don't hate you. And she's like, well, if it's not hate, is it love? And Big Nung's like, yes. And then Little Nung's like, and L- Big Nung's like, fuck, what did I just say? And Little Nung's like, ha you said it, you said it. And this is the same scenario, but it's, instead of pointing it out, you said it. She's just like, she's too serious right now. I'm just going to let her do whatever. And I'm just going <laughs> to accelerate that I got it. I got the cookie. All right. So after that officially girlfriend's moment, the, the Nungs arrive at Little Nung's grandmother's house. And there's an unfamiliar car in the driveway. And Long's like, oh God, whose car is this? Like, I I think her brain is like, do I have another mystery parent? Is this another (laughs) suitor for me, for Big Nung, a fandom stalker? Like, what is going on? Whose car is this? I think she's worried. She's like, what the fuck is this? What the fuck is this? (laughs) Another mystery parent. (laughs) Can you imagine? Oh my gosh. Uh, But... Big Nung kind of looks at it in the beginning, and there's a split second where it looks like she's thinking, that asshole, I told him not to do it. Absolutely. He never listens. He never listens. We're getting way too much chat right now, and I'm not into it. I mean, we gotta get him in here. He's part of the drama. So, yeah. Big Nung explains, she's like, look, it's your car, Little Nung. And Little Nung's like, what? What? Why? Because she doesn't understand. Why would she? She didn't ask for any of this. But so, also, Big Nung didn't fully know that it was her car. She just assumed as She's well. assuming. Right? It could have been a mystery parent. Could have been a stalker. <laughs> yeah. We don't know. Like, it could have been folks new car. She's, she is also assuming in the scene. I wonder if Chet's... I don't know. No, that doesn't make sense. Anyway, Maybe he showed her a picture of the car that he wanted to get her. I, you know, maybe he called her off screen and was like, I did it. And she's like, you accepted her? And he's like, no, I got her car. What do you mean? <laughs> that would definitely be how it went. That would definitely be how that went. So, unfortunately, they go inside where Chet explains he went through his, with his ill-advised plan to purchase Little Nung's love. I mean, a car. And just like that, the Little Nung, just as the Little Nung whisperer predicted... Little Nung then tells Chet straight up, I don't want a car, I don't know how to drive, and I don't want to learn how to drive. And really, why would she want to? 
Right. Having the love of her life drive her around means they get to spend more time together, which is all little known wants. Also, cars are scary, and she's about to get her own car drama in the next episode, so. Right. I understand. Also, yeah, it's, okay. And then, and then if you notice, Little Nung tries to look to Big Nung for help in this conversation to be like, how to get me out of this. But she's, like, she goes to look, but then doesn't. She, like, stops herself from making eye contact to, like, plea with Big Nung. And I read this as Little Nung coming into her adulthood with her family. So instead of, like, looking to an older adult, like, the knight in shining armor to help her, She's going to stand up for herself by fully facing off with Chet and the grandmother and standing up for what she wants. Instead of being like, Big Nung, get me out of this. Like, speak on my behalf. You have more authority. Like, Little Nung stands her ground in this conversation with them, which is different. Because, again, she is, like you said, a full, she's a full-blown woman at this point, And, like, they need to see her that way. That's the issue. So, but the family members... see her like that? Huh? But will they ever actually see her like that? Eventually, yeah. Just You know, she's... It takes time. Like, she just, like, left the nest or whatever. Like, you know what I mean? It takes time. So the family members' reactions are predictable, but still heartbreaking. So, start with Chet. So Chet doesn't understand why she doesn't want a car. So he mansplains why cars are good. <laughs> Which is him projecting his own opinions onto her, as always, without listening to her. Meanwhile, the grandmother's face falls when Little Nung rejects Chet's gift. She's more concerned with Little Nung's, quote, disrespectful behavior than what Little Nung is telling everybody she wants. She tells Little Nung to accept the gift out of politeness, regardless of whether or not she wants it. And Chet is pleased with this logic and hands over the keys to Little Nung. And Little Nung's like, all right, well, I guess I'm being backed into a corner. And uh, so she mulls us over for a second. While Big Nong looks super annoyed at this entire thing. Because, like, she tried to prevent this from happening. And Big Nong empathizes with Little Nong in the scene. And knows that Little Nong is being backed into a corner by family obligation right now. That's what's actively happening in the scene. I mean, yes. It does make sense that the grandmother is like, you're being rude and it's reflecting on me. Like, I raised you better than that. Quote. But the issue is that Chet doesn't listen. So, like... You can't be polite to him. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yep. Yeah, it's basically Chet's the entire issue in the show. Yeah. So yeah, Little Nung is, he's the issue. And Little Nung is, again, being backed into a corner by family obligation. Big Nung feels empathetic towards her. But Little Nung is no ordinary bitch. She's a petty bitch who gets what she wants. So Little Nung meets Chet halfway and she's like, okay, I'll take the car. But only if Big Nung can teach me how to drive instead of you. And that's when Little Nung finally makes eye contact with Big Nung. And she's like, please, Big Nung. (laughs) You can't say no to me. But again, Big Nung's like, we are in a family situation right now. And so she starts looking over at Chet. And the family dynamics start getting more awkward. Because Little Nung, again, is begging Big Nung to agree to this, to what she wants, and not what Chet's saying. And he's the father in the scenario and the gift giver. And Big Nung, who knows the protocol here, looks at Chet and silently asking him for permission. She's like, can I give her what she wants? Because that's the protocol in this situation. And, you know, so like, and you would think this is the woman who rejected him openly when it was them alone. And why is she doing this? Because Big Nung is trying her damnedest to balance her girlfriend's happiness with scoring points with the girlfriend's family to stay in their good graces when their relationship inevitably comes out. So if Big Nung can do the proper thing by suggesting to Little Nung, because she, 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 what she does, she's like, how about you let your dad teach you to drive, like, so that he can show you how to use the gift and also, like, you guys can bond, which is really what he's trying to do here. Like, then you can ha- ha- decide whether or not you actually hate him or not once you get to know. Not that you don't know him. But, like, you guys don't know each other, really. It's just Chet's abrasive, at, you know, at the worst. And doesn't listen. But Little Nung doesn't see it that way. She's like, you know, from her point of view, this is another instance of everyone, everyone, dismissing her feelings and not listening to her. So she openly starts pouting. And for once, for once, when Little Nung starts pouting, Chet reads the room. And agrees to Little Nung's terms. 
I am honestly shocked that he agreed to let Big Nung teach her. I really thought the whole point of this car was to trap her in a confined space so she would have to spend time with him. But now it's just like an expensive gift. I mean, in the same way, it's trying to buy her love, but I feel like the bonding part of it was his goal as well. Yeah, and if you notice, she didn't want either of them. She's like, I don't want the gift. I don't want your love. I don't want either of those things. So Big Nung talked her kind of into half the gift a little bit. Like, Luong's like, all right, I'll take the car, but I don't want you attached. I don't want to attach. I don't want to owe you anything. Like, I don't want anything from you is what Little Nung is really saying. And I think it, it, we'll get into the next scene, what actually clicks for Chet. But like, he's like, okay, if I can at least give you the car, I'll take that win. At least I'm being a father in the scene in one capacity. If she doesn't want to spend time with me, she'd rather Big Nung treat her. It's Little Nung showing who she loves. And that's when he's like, all right, fine. So Little Nung perks up immediately and hands a flabbergasted Big Nung the car keys. And Big Nung's like, fuck, I didn't think that was going to work. <laughs> God damn it, I got to teach you to drive. All right, so after that, for some reason, Chet and Big Nung have a sidebar out by the pool. Because Big Nung is upset and she's like, ah. And so she's sulking by bodies of water. So I assume mm-hmm. Chet came out there as like... All right, uh, let's let's talk because we put our conversation on hold. And the first thing he says is, he's like, Ping Fu was right. Little Nung only loves you. That's what he. That's what finally clicked for him in that scene. That like, because again, he's uh, he doesn't listen about how to actually get his daughter to love him. He's just going about it his way, and it does not work. And this was, I think, the one of the final nails in the coffin for him with his methods, where he's like, wow, like yeah. She only loves Big Nung. Because Big Nung's there and she's like, no, I only, I only want her to show me. I don't want you. And he's like, okay. That finally, it's clicking. It's he's amazing what happens when you treat someone like a person. Yep, it's amazing. Which he still doesn't understand. So, because again, he's expressing his frustration. He's like, hey, she's like, Bit Along does not love her parents. She only loves you, Big Nung. And nobody can compete with you for her affection. No one can compete with Big Nung to begin with. Well, there's that, but they don't know that. And this, <laughs> and this entire conversation could be summed up with this one line from Big Nung, which is, I just said it, but you never listened. <laughs> because she's like, it's easy to get her to love you. I've told you a million times what to do, and you're not listening. Because Chet is still clueless about Little Nung. And Big Nung is just like, just listen. That's literally it. Stop asking me these questions. I'm done. And then he tries to broach the marriage topic again. He's like, well, we can be one big happy family. She loves you. And then if I love you, she'll love me. And then maybe you'll love me. And it's like, bro, can we not? He just doesn't get it. Like, I know we've talked at nauseum at this point about how stupid he is. But there's no indication that she loves you. Nothing. At all. Neither of these women love you. Like, no, why no would they one add loves you? To, right. Why would they add you to the equation? Their math already works. Adding you does not sol- add anything to, like, it does not benefit either of these women. It just benefits you. And they, they can see that. You're the only one that can't see that. So anyway, I, what I do like about this conversation, I will not go into this conversation at nauseum because we've already done this. But what I do like is that Big Nung does call him out directly for using little nung as an excuse to wife her so it's like thank you big nung for also pointing out the obvious that he's using his daughter he claims to want to get to know and she's like look it, this is impossible between us stop trying to be, stop trying to make fetch happen it's not gonna happen chad <laughs> he then says that they are perfect for each other and i really want to know how he came to this conclusion because i'm sure what he meant was you look perfect on my arm yeah no this is all about how they look on paper that's all this, that's what the, that's why they were set up in the first place by the Grand Man. Remember, the Grand Man vetted Chet. How is Chet, why is Chet here? The Grand Man. The Grand Man vetted him. She was like, okay, prominent family, prime minister, you have aspirations, everything looks clean, you can marry my eldest daughter. And then he's like, yeah, we do look great on paper. That's it, that's it. It's because the Grand Man, that's why. That mm-hmm. shit, that's what he means. We're perfect on paper. And now we are even more perfect because I have a daughter, you love my daughter, I love my daughter. Now we can all be a happy family together. Like that's perfect. Like I've seen you parent her, quote or whatever, and she loves you. That makes it perfect because she doesn't even love her own parents. So there is a moment where it looks like Big Nung rolls her eyes a bit. 
Yes. Because, yes, yeah, she definitely loves and adores Little Nung, just not in the way he thinks. No, it never is in the way they think. Nope. Which makes all these conversations awkward for Big Nung constantly. All right, so eventually Chet's brain cell, the only one he has, starts functioning enough to put something very important together. And he's like, wait a minute, do you not want to marry me because you love somebody else? And Big Nung answers this by not answering this, which means yes. And instead says... Let's chat. That's that's a moot point um, because what matters is that I don't love you and I never have. And like for us to get married, that is my only requirement. So that makes it impossible. I don't love you. And Chet sighs a lot during this and Big Nung says, I hope you understand because she's as tired as we are of having this circular conversation with Chet. She's like, this is the last time we're going to talk about this because I can't, I li- there's literally no more words. I got Forget nothing else. the rest of the series that led up to this point. In this episode we've had to talk about, and it's only half of the episode so far. Chet. We've had the same conversation multiple times. And I don't, and she's like, how, how else do I need to say this to you? No, Chet, no. <laughs> Stop trying to wife me. I don't want to wife you. Anyway, fuck chat. <laughs> so that's where we're going to conclude this. Unfortunately, that's, yeah, we can't get into the rest of this episode because we've already been here for three hours talking. So, uh, Taylor Swift songs. Oh. I don't think we brought up one for this episode. I don't think so either. We just <sighs> brought up a lot of, like, movie references. Exile. Because, like, uh, yeah, I mean, chat- that's a- for Chet and Nung, so where many it's signs. like, there's so many signs, Chet. The biggest sign is her saying no. That is very <laughs> And he's like, you, you gave never a warning sign, Nung. And she's like, I gave so many signs, Chet. You still so don't get it. So many. I so told many. you straight up. I don't like you. Right. Straight up. Like, that's what I mean. She's taken every tactic with this man, and he's still like, I don't get it. I'm surprised she doesn't run away just to be like, again, to be like, do you get it now? <laughs> anyway, with Little Nong, obviously, not by herself. Yeah, I think Exile. And then I think um, Paper Rings was Little Nong in the car <laughs> when she's like, you're going to marry me one day because you love me. I like shiny things, but I'd marry you with Paper Rings. Paper That's rings Little Nong's brain. <laughs> Darling, you're the one I want. Yeah, that's Little Nung with the marriage stuff. Oh my gosh. I love how every time we come to this section, I all Taylor Swift songs leave my mind. I mean, I all really too well, that. because not not like the actual story. All too it, well like, is Chet, but it's not accurate. <laughs> all too well oh, is just like, like red song, we've been here before. Oh. No, but like the pining no, it's not rare, is though. Chet. He's mm-hmm. like, he still has her scarf that the grandma <laughs> gave him. Like, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, and he's like, you left the best thing you ever had and blah, 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 Nung. You could have me back. And then she's no, like, that is not what happened, I Chet, think, at all. I think Chet is teardrops on my guitar. I believe it was like, Drew looks at me. And it's just like all about the things. Like, she's just existing. And. <laughs> And he's just, like, pining for her, basically. Yeah. Okay. A big gay energy yeah. award. To me, it's Little Nung getting Big Nung to admit that she's her girlfriend. Anytime she plays those games and gets Big Nung to admit shit like that, and this time Big Nung has no idea she said it. Hi, like, so much lesbian Jesus center and Good job, Little Nung. Mine, I think, is Juan Viva, actually. Ooh, Juan Viva was good in this scene. Yeah. yeah. I like, I really like that episode. scene because, one, it shows that she's accepting. I mean, she's got big gay energy herself. So much. She's off the charts. Yeah. Off and just charts. be like, come on, you, we have to hydrate for you so much. Look at yourself. Look at Little Nut. You guys, you're obvious. Like, the line, you're so obvious fully accurate so i give it to Juan viva yep all right all right well if you made it this far in the episode i'm going to give you a secret word for you to use in a review or a comment just naturally so today's word is pseudonym 
Little Nung should have used a pseudonym. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> or an alias. <laughs> yeah. Is that what yeah. that means? I, I don't know the full definition. Oh, my God. Anyway. This is anyway spell it. Have fun with that. Yeah. Although the people, we, you guys have outed yourselves. They're like, I watched this with subtitles. So then it tells me how to spell it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Car. I was like, well, damn it. <laughs> I'm like, that's words in other languages. <laughs> anyway. So that was that. So we'll be back next time to conclude the last two parts of episode four. And until next time, hydrate for lesbian Jesus. And gay it up all over the place. Bye. Bye. And with that, we've been Big Gay Energy. If you like this episode, check out all our other episodes right here on YouTube. Please like, leave a comment below, and subscribe for more amazing super gay content.